one o'clock. I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, June 17th, 2024. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. I move. I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The agenda is approved as written. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda items. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. So the agenda is approved as written. Uh, Karen, mm -hmm. we're muted. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh. Do we not include the portion of the public? Recording in progress. Uh, uh, noted in the uh, <coughs> minutes that both the agenda and the uh, consent agenda items have been approved. Next is the public session. Uh, anyone wishing to address any items not uh, presented in the, uh, I have to finish my little speech, uh, not presented in the warrant agenda, please come forward and I ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. Anything needing more attention than that, we'll be glad to take it up in the SOI meeting. Now, Mike coming? Is it okay if I take his spot here? Oh, please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mike is uh, fishing. Do do a fishing oh, that's a good plan. I, we expect him in about half an hour. Okay, great. Well, hi. Uh, I'm Mel Culbertson. I'm a resident of Waterbury, uh, and I've got a little prepared statement for you. Um, I've come to ask you again to uh, pass a ceasefire resolution relating to the ongoing conflict in Gaza. After I first approached the board about this issue in February, I was eventually told that while the board sympathizes, it would not put time on the agenda to discuss the resolution as there was not enough perceived public support and the board has very limited time. Today, I bring you a petition signed by more than 70 Waterbury residents expressing their support for this board to pass a ceasefire resolution. But I've printed a copy of the petition uh, as well as the proposed resolution language that was included in this petition for your review. There's one for the five board members and then one for Karen. Yes. Uh, if I may, I'd like to read the letter on that petition for the board now. It says, we the undersigned Waterbury, Vermont residents, businesses, and community organizations implore you to adopt the below resolution in support of an immediate permanent ceasefire in Gaza. The immediate end to unconditional military aid to the State of Israel and the Israeli Defense Forces, and an end to the occupation of Palestine. We urge you to use your platforms to amplify this call for a ceasefire to our representatives in the Vermont Legislature, our Congressional Delegation, and to President Biden. The Israeli government's response to the October 7th attack has killed more than 35,000 people in Gaza and created a humanitarian crisis that now threatens all Palestinians in Gaza with starvation. 1.7 million Palestinians were forced to flee their homes to seek safety in Rafa, an area half the size of Waterbury, and now face the threat of an Israeli ground invasion. The situation in Gaza is dire, and the time for action is long past, but the first thing we can do is now. Waterbury stands firmly against Islamophobia and anti-Semitism in all forms and mourns the loss of so many lives to the violence in Gaza. We call on you as our elected officials to demand peace. This is not a matter of solving the conflict or providing answers to a decades-long struggle. This is about the people of Waterbury appealing to their elected representatives to enact legislation that aligns with their values. We do not want billions of our tax dollars to be sent overseas to kill Palestinians. We want our government to operate in good faith and use its influence to help negotiate a lasting ceasefire. We want a release of all hostages both the remaining 80 Israelis held in Gaza and the thousands of Palestinians held in Israel. This may not seem like a Waterbury issue, but it is an issue for all Americans. And as a representative democracy, this is our venue to make our voices heard. With the significant public support demonstrated by the petition and others who have come to speak in support, I ask that the board add the ceasefire resolution 
to the agenda today or to a coming meeting and join the many cities and towns around the world that are calling for peace. Thank you. Um, I also have a digital copy of the language, if that's helpful, Karen. Um, so you don't have to like. You didn't just read this? Uh, there's actually no. resolution language um, okay. that I did not read, and I'm happy to provide that. I was actually wondering where the signatures were. That oh, I didn't include those, language. but I can print those out as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mel. Uh, um, we're, we can't legally uh, put it on the agenda today because we have to warn 48 hours in advance. Um, but it would be uh, well disposed to put it on the agenda on the January 1st meeting. Uh, July. 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 <laughs> July. <laughs> July. <laughs> uh, no, uh, July 1st. Uh, and um, I would encourage you to continue to get more signatures. So uh, we have how many voters? 2,000? 4,000. 4,000 voters in the town. So the more the better, honestly. Uh, so. Thank you. You bet. Uh, yes, Nicole. <clears throat> My name is Nicole Grenier, and I'm a resident of Waterbury Center. And I'd like to read something that I've prepared for you this evening. Um, first, I want to thank the Select Board for my time to share <clears throat> and for your public service. Recently, a few too many people, in my opinion, seem to feel that just because they are entitled to be heard for a few minutes in this meeting, somehow that also means that they can speak and act however they might like, no matter how disrespectful or uncalled for. As a lifelong advocate and activist for children, for safe and healthy communities and families, I've testified in my fair share of courtrooms and at the legislature, and I've spoken publicly about plenty of tough subjects with plenty of people who don't agree with me. This is not about you or I being tough enough to take it. It is about protecting and preserving this forum as a safe space for any of us to come forward and speak. We are counting on all of you to hold reasonable standards of conduct to protect this forum as one where the public comment and public participation of many is not unintentionally stifled by, the ena by enabling the bad behavior of a few. I'm speaking uh, to share my support for the call for the Waterbury Select Board to adopt a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. There has never been a war in history where 80% of a country has been destroyed, 100% of the population has been displaced, and 50% of the deaths have been children. Most of us know, or should know, the infamous black and white photo of the nine-year-old Vietnamese girl known as the napalm girl, running and screaming with her body severely burned from a napalm attack during the Vietnam War. This photo gave a face to the innocent victims of the war and moved Americans to protest and pressure the US government to end the war in Vietnam. How the photos and videos from Gaza have yet to compel us to end this war is baffling to me. These images will stay with me for the rest of my life, and when I hear that this conflict is complicated, it is these images that stand in opposition, because there is literally nothing you could tell me that will ever justify the killing of innocent children. The children are all of our children all over the globe. All human life is precious. <clears throat> Members of our local community are absolutely affected and impacted by this war. This ceasefire resolution may not fix anything right away, but don't let us dare say that it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter, and it doesn't have anything to do with us. Civil rights, gay rights, women rights have all come to be because of people speaking up, not staying silent, and having the courage and endurance to keep speaking out long before policymakers would consider taking action. Cities and towns are increasing pressure on Congress to finally act in the name of justice instead of power and profit, and each additional resolution that passes helps increase that pressure. Let's not act as though this discussion will keep us from focusing on other local issues. Over 100 cities and towns have already passed ceasefire resolutions, including at least a dozen of so in Vermont, and none of their municipal functions have grinded to a halt. Local government is our closest proximity to government power. The Vermont legislature sent a letter to President Biden to call for a permanent ceasefire, which included all three of Waterbury's state senators, and both U.S. Senator Welch and Representative Ballant have called for a ceasefire as well. This is not about having all the answers, and it's also not about taking the easy way out by claiming that it has nothing to do with us. You say you want our select board to focus on local issues. Great. 
I want our tax dollars to fund local issues instead of funding the killing of children to the town tune of $3.8 billion every year on average with another $14 billion on the table. Those numbers break down to $5.8 million from Vermont and $77,000 from Waterbury, all going to fund this war. What our state and our town could do for affordable housing, our schools, and our roads with that money instead. There is a long history of cities passing resolutions to express where a community stands on certain issues, including Ukraine, South Africa, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, and others. A resolution is not about jurisdiction or ability to solve war in the Middle East or anywhere else. We may not have much control or influence over this situation, but taking this action is not simply performative or useless. A ceasefire resolution is by no means the most or the best we can do. It is the least that we can do. Please join me and others in calling for a resolution for an immediate and sustained humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Hundreds and thousands of more lives are at imminent risk if a ceasefire is not achieved and a humanitarian aid is not delivered. Thank you. Yes. Hi, can I speak back here? Uh, if you prefer, okay. but we need your name. My name is Jack. Oh, I don't know. Can we hear? Can we hear? Yeah, it would be better if you came okay. yeah, forward for my performance. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Um, my name is Jennifer Chiomi McKibben. Uh, I am here briefly to say that I am in support of the um, ceasefire resolution that has put forward. I share the sentiments that have been shared already with Mallory and with Nicole. Um, and that's, I just want to say that I agree with that. Thank okay, thanks for coming forward. Hello, Hi. I'm Tessa Yip. Um, I'm a Waterbury resident. Uh, I just have a relatively quick prepared statement I just want to go on record with, kind of backing up Chiomi and Nicole and Mal. Um, I am also here to urge the Waterbury Select Board to take up a resolution uh, which calls for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza, an end to the unconditional military aid to the Israeli government, and end to the occupation of Palestine. I understand you might be asking yourselves, why as a Select Board should we spend time on this topic? As U.S. taxpayers, our money is repeatedly being sent to fund the indiscriminate bombing and forced starvation of Palestinians by the Israeli government. As a resident, I will not accept my tax dollars being sent to fund a genocide. Of the millions of dollars from Vermont taxpayers going to, going to Israeli military support, how much could it actually be put towards our own communities? This resolution is also a reminder to our state and national representatives that their constituents refuse to be complicit in genocide. All levels of government, including the city and town levels, ought to be responsible for taking a stance. Just like Nicole also said, over 100 U.S. cities and towns have passed ceasefire resolutions, including at least 11 Vermont towns. As Waterbury residents, our voices and opinions don't matter less because we're a small town in a small state. U.S. communities need to go on record in opposition to numerous violations of international law that are financially supported by our own government. Ultimately, a ceasefire resolution is an act of unity and solidarity towards Palestinian people. Over 35,000 Palestinian men, women, and children are now dead. And if they stayed alive, they've had to leave their homes, forced to live in inhumane conditions, and are starved to death. I hope that you, as a select board, will listen to Waterloo residents and take a courageous step. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Scott. Thank you. So first thing I would say is thank you. Oh, Scott Calver, Waterbury. So I'd like say first thing is thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak tonight in regard to an entertainment permit that was granted by your board on the 5-6-2024. This is, uh, I have sent each one of you a detailed email today, which I know I didn't get on the agenda. I was a little late. Karen's a little quicker than I was, so. Instead of being an agenda item, I want it to be a topic just to, to get out there. So I sent a detailed email today with my concerns that I feel have not been addressed at this point. Um, these matters pertain to life and safety as well as uh, portions of the event that go against town and village ordinances that I outlined in the email that I had sent. Um, I hope that each of you have read the email, think about the concerns um, that I have outlined it moved to revoke, rescind the entertainment permit that was granted on 5-6-2024 to Ashley Mativier and Angela M. Selly. All right, thank you. 
Alyssa, yours went, it didn't yeah. mail. So I, I was just going to say, I was on email right before this and meeting. And I resent don't it call. to you. Okay. So if you didn't get it, please let me know and I will be sure to resend it to you. Okay, uh, as you know. Yeah, I don't have a copy of that. Yeah. I will be sure to resend it. I respect that, and like I said, I missed it, but there will not be another select board meeting before that, so if I get in here to do my public setup, then I think that should be warrant enough to at least have you guys look at it to make sure that the decisions that we make at this board follow the ordinances that we're supposed to be following from the beginning. And that's my concern, that's what I'm hoping is going to happen, and uh, I will leave you with that. And if you have any questions or concerns for me, please feel free to reach out, email, call, more than happy to talk about it. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? There is an online. Uh, Valerie would like to speak. Yeah. She's unable to raise her hand, but. Hi, this is Valerie. I think I must have an old Zoom option. Um, I have a question about phase one zoning. I do see phase two is on the agenda tonight. Should I wait for that agenda item? Uh, you can. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the because uh, the select board opted uh, to go with a substantive uh, difference in what was proposed, uh, that the uh, plan commission has to have an open uh, hearing on the change if they choose to adopt the change that was suggested. And that hasn't happened yet. I was just unclear on phase one for the downtown district. It doesn't really reference permitted use of single family residents. So I can wait for later or another meeting. It that it's not single family homes are not listed on permitted use for phase one in the downtown district. Right. Um, so I would like it to be. Yeah, I think the motion as I understand it was uh, to uh, make uh, single family homes a conditional use in mixed use uh, zoning areas. Right. I did see multi use, but I know zoning is uh, downtown is actually delegated, mapped out separately. So, but yeah. I'm going to go with you, Roger, and it's all mm -hmm. the same. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think you just said that it was the motion was made for the districts to allow single family homes. Uh, Ian made the, the uh, motion. Ian, you want to clarify? Um, the, the point of contention was about um, the ability to, um, well, two pieces. One was the ability to convert duplexes back into single family homes. Um, and the other point was the building of more single family homes, to my understanding. Um, so when you reference multifamily district, you are encompassing downtown district in that decision or that proposal. I believe it, the point of contention was in the mixed use districts. Right, but I'm talking about downtown district right. where it doesn't even talk about single family homes. Valerie, do you remember which meeting? Because I could probably pretty quickly find the motion. Uh, May 20th. It was very specific to multi-use district. And I think the planning commission parceled off downtown as a separate district. And in the phase one, there is no mention of a permitted use at all for single family. So I would like to um, propose that in that proposal, in the phase one or two, that the permitted use is single family and also the ability, if it's a duplex, to convert it back to single family. I got a little lost in the details, I'll be honest. The motion says um, that you, it says Ian Shane made a motion to make single family home a conditional use in the mixed use district. Right. And I'm not in the mixed use and district. That's the only district mentioned in the motion. Yeah. Right. And I would like to challenge that I guess for the downtown uh, I think that if you live in downtown I mean who wants a downtown without residential homes I mean I don't think it should be not permitted well I think you know, we, have, we have to discuss this at some point but uh, okay. the, the uh, single family houses homes that are existing 
will uh, continue to be uh, allowed in perpetuity uh, as they currently exist. Right. And I'm outside of that zone, so I'm happy to talk to somebody else at another time. Okay. Uh, well, I believe that the uh, Planning Commission is planning to have a hearing on this again. Uh, do you know about that, Billy? No, we thought... <coughs> It, it'll be in our, it'll be in the select board's agenda as a public hearing on July 1st. Okay. The planning commission met when we were meeting, so I'm on planning commission approved minutes of their meeting Monday, June 3rd, I believe outdoors in the sunshine. Um, mm -hmm. And they did make changes based on the minutes from the May 20th select board meeting, and there will be a public hearing for us on the select board on July 1st. So it's okay. not on the agenda for tonight, but prior to subsequent adoption, we would have a hearing for comment at our next meeting. There you go. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Okay, any other issues uh, for public comment? All right, let's move on. Next agenda item is uh, the um, Economic Development Strategic Plan. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Owen Seti Ducati. Um, I am here with Revitalizing Waterbury. I am the current economic uh, development director for uh, okay. um, for Revitalizing Waterbury, and um, one of the general goals for the um, position is to redo this strategic plan. The last time it was rewritten was, I believe, five years ago, um, maybe six. This was supposed to be a consistent thing that was getting kind of redone, um, which may have gone by the wayside a little bit. Um, so I am here to ask for your support in endorsing this plan. Um, it provides goals for municipal entities and um, economic development entities in the town. Um, it's supported by the Waterbury Area Development Committee, which is the committee that provides uh, advisory services to myself and two of the members also sit on the UDAG Loan Committee. The plan goes through assumptions and goals around development, um, Waterbury strengths and weaknesses, um, and then economic strategies to remedy those weaknesses specifically, um, as well as specific uh, actionable items for the economic development director. Kind of the point of this is to provide a reference point for um, this role, as well as the town in making decisions in terms of development. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, there are some minor edits I might need to make, um, as I was talking to Alyssa about this kind of before the meeting, um, just around things like area median income, um, which changed due to the fiscal year um, getting updated and so on and so forth, and some slight language changes. I also changed the language to be um, endorsed, not adopted, because it is not a town plan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question for Owen. I'll start. Um, <laughs> You mentioned the uh, Route 100 and Route 2 corridors. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the uh, potential and um, constraints on those two areas of development? I would Given say, the fact that the downtown areas are in pretty good Yeah. Sense. Um, I would say the constraints for the Route 100 are primarily traffic and conservation land around there, um, depending on how that gets zoned. It should also make some differences on kind of what gets developed there, but I'd say the traffic buildup between here and Stowe would be the main concern in building that area out. Um, as long as you were sticking with parcels that are along that road, I don't think the sprawl would get crazy, and I don't think that's the goal of this, but if that was to occur, you would have to do something to mitigate traffic. Um, and then Route 2, I would say, is primarily the floodplain management. Mm -hmm. And also, um, just the, uh, one, of, one of the reasons I asked is that there's uh, a move with our um, 
EFUD uh, Utility Commission uh, to bring water mm -hmm. to uh, the Route 100 corridor. Uh, as of yet, they haven't uh, also decided to bring a sewer, which I understand to be considerably more expensive. Uh, but those would also be, I think, constraints on uh, further development there. Yeah, and that is mentioned to a degree in here, um, specifically <coughs> the water sewer. Yeah, and to give an idea, um, we're looking at a, a 2,000 square foot water line that would run from near the highway garage in Guptal over to 100, and that 2,000 feet um, is in the range of 3 million, and that was a that's a two year old number. Um, SOAR is um, per linear foot, probably triple that number, if not more. So it's it's almost. Um, you know, SOAR ends um, a little bit past Ben and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. So to extend SOAR, you know, if you want to talk a mile of SOAR, we you know, just beyond the capabilities of, of the town, EFUD, um, you know, it would be, you know, both of our senators earmarked for a couple of years to get that done. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's just a, just a huge figure. And I know that the Planning Commission is also going to be looking at Phase 2. Uh, so the component of that will be further development of the corridor. And how uh, so that fits in with the town plan. And then we've got to revise that plan. So, a few, few different issues there. Uh, any other questions? Melissa? Yeah, I was just going to name one. I'll take responsibility of that. In my three and a half years, I didn't update the economic development strategic <laughs> plan as EDD. Um, so I think it's great to have uh, this is a bit of an oddity in that it sits in this outside committee. And so just noting, like, that's that endorsed language. That's acknowledging that we have a town plan that by default is regulatory. This is not that, but this is to help support Owen and the committee's work um, and just acknowledge that nuance. Um, and just for me, it's interesting to reflect on some of the early versions of this, like the Cornerstone project when this was first written was getting the state office complex back after Tropical Storm Irene. So seeing now that's kind of, you know, a footnote at the end around kind of current status that it is back and now remote work is kind of um, what folks are looking at. So um, I think Owen Wall captures a lot of the stuff we've talked about here on utilities and we just also note that the primary thing they're saying is housing so just acknowledging we're doing a lot of other work as a select board around housing and so you know it's an end in its own right and it's also just called out in this plan specifically as being important for Waterbury's economic future. Okay. Um, this section here about Waterbury Center and the um, downtown designation. Yeah. Um, I read it in the email, and then I've read reread it twice now. Is there, though there is right tax credits that property owners can apply for, is there some sort of feeling that we want to drive up commerce in that area? Um, I wouldn't say commerce specifically, but I would say just kind of going with the smart growth initiatives and how the state approaches development is that focusing on those kind of hub or central areas that already have a degree of development would be the goal there. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I just mentioned that it's the state, right. the Congress and community development um, is how they get those. But I, I think focusing on the hubs in terms of the Route 100 development and downtown development, which is already a bit of a hub, would probably be the best way to go about that. Um, so yeah, not commerce specifically, but okay. in general development. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was curious to read about um, thoughts on Pilgrim Park, which is an interesting area with lots of land, lots of parking um, already, some sizable buildings, um, and the new zone bylaws allowing for conditional multi-use housing <laughs> in that area. Can we speak more to <coughs> thoughts on Pilgrim Park? Yeah, um, I mean, with the new zoning, um, now that there is ideally going to be conditional usage within there, um, I think a housing development in Pilgrim Park would be a pretty reasonable goal, um, depending on if the property owner um, supports that idea. Um, it is relatively out of the way of the downtown. It doesn't kind of 
hamper the historic character of the downtown, given that it's already a large industrial park. Um, it has sewer water access. It's out of the floodplain. Um, so specifically, the parcel that is in front of uh, Pilgrim 5 would make a pretty good spot, in my opinion, for uh, larger scale multifamily housing units. Um, yeah. So there is Pilgrim 5? Um, it's the office building. Yeah. Oh, okay. And there's a big green in front yeah. of it. Gotcha. Yeah. That is. <laughs> We're moving it to your backyard. <laughs> I also think as you take, if you go um, down Railroad Street from Stowe Street, mm -hmm. um, kind of as soon as you enter the park, that area right there, I think, is pretty, pretty good prime spot. Yeah. Way out of the floodplain too. Any further questions for all? Yes, Tom. It's on the Yeah, so on the Yeah, 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 on mainly focus questions okay. and missions, right? So yeah. revitalizing Waterbury, economic development, Yeah, Yeah, right? So a lot of discussion of housing. Yeah, I would say there's a balance at times between economic development and housing. I hear a lot about affordable housing yep. and that we need to have housing for workforce. Yep. I'm starting to be a little concerned that we're talking about facilities like Industrial Park where we just had, um, okay, so Green Mountain Coffee Roasters yep. is gone. Um, now we finally have someone in there. Yep. And we've got a uh, couple of things going on in that one facility, Core Power. Core Power, um, uh, Mavic. A lot of contracts out in Arizona, though. I'd be very yeah. concerned about that. Um, so I'm not saying they're leaving, by the way. I'm just saying I'd yeah. be concerned that balance. And on as your mission as the economic development person, is it synchronized with the economics of business or with more of the strategy of housing? I would say... It is more focused on the economics of business and building out the business sector of a municipality. Um, and I would say five years ago, you wouldn't see this much housing conversation in something along these lines. And the committee um, used to not have this much discussion of housing. But when I have talked to individuals at CORE or individuals at like Cabot, um, even though they're not here, but that's just an example, um, their primary issue they tend to find is that getting and retaining workers due to the housing issues is incredibly difficult for them. Um, like CORE specifically mentioned that that was maybe their, if they were to leave, their main lead reason for leaving would be lack of housing and inability to find um, people to work at the actual company. So that's kind of why the housing gets brought up so much is in regular conversations with especially the larger businesses in the town, housing always comes up as just an issue. And do we have an idea of the workforce in Waterbury tied to those particular, I would, I would call them fairly uh, consistent positions? I mean, CORE's probably got, what size? Kind of. I've been trying to get data on okay. that specifically. Yes. Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to obtain that without paying a decent amount of money. Is kind of the issue. Yeah. I might be able to ask people that work there. Just, I, I'm helpful, just yeah. thinking at, at some point in time. I I think it's been said before. It's it's. Uh, I used to have a boss who used to say, "In God we trust. All others bring data." Yeah. Um, and. The idea was, if you're looking for decisions, this is a, a, a strategy, and I think it's, yeah. it's good, like I said, on the front end of this. It's just the idea of balance comes to mind because I, I think there, there is a bit of a bias at times, I think, in, in one particular direction. Sometimes we get it about right. What I liked about this was the idea of Waterbury Center. It's the first time I've seen something start to focus a little bit, mm -hmm. on, and not just Route 100, Right? And kind of looking at, when I was growing up in this town, there were two general stores in Waters. Yeah. Um, there's nothing there now. Yeah. I mean, <coughs> you have it, you know, on the way there, and you've got, so that little center complex, maybe there's no area to develop mm -hmm. there anymore? Or is there, has anybody looked at that area? Uh, it's well, that, all residential housing on the Triangle, where Hollow, mm -hmm. Howard, and Guptill and Maple all meet. It's all housing. It's all Yeah, but there's all other homes. areas. 
yeah. in yeah. Library Center that have land much less dense, and I get water and sewer. I understand that, but we're going to do a little bit of investment, I think, to get the, the water line to 100, maybe in five years. See, to me, a strategy is 20 and 25 yeah. years out. Yeah. Right. It, that's my only point. We, we are going to max out water. Rate. Might not like it, but at some point in time, there's not going to be anything else to build. And if we keep going down a path where it's all housing, uh, I'm not yeah, saying it's all housing, yeah. right? I'm just saying there's a real good focus there. Yeah. I would like to see someone other than uh, the Housing Task Force, the mm -hmm. Planning Commission. But to me, revitalizing Waterbury, and, and I don't know the entire mission, but it seems to me it should be very much attracting businesses. Yeah, That's and that is that does tend to be what I end up doing in my okay. day to day a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for Again, your comments. I, think I appreciate it. Product, yeah. I think just maybe a, a look at some of the metrics. How many people are actually employed by some of those companies? Yeah, yeah. You know, we looking to how are, are they? Be nice to know what what percentage actually live in water. Yeah, that would be a good okay. info to have. Yeah. Thank, thank you for you. your comments. I appreciate them. Yes, <coughs> Philip. Big door plan. Uh, well, I'm speaking on my own behalf. Not really <laughs> First of all, this is great. Thank you very Thank you. much. I guess what I wasn't sure about one question really, mm -hmm. well, two questions. There are references to the new bylaws, but <coughs> there seem to be suggestions that bylaws should do the following. So, yeah. to what extent are these based on what the select board is about to pass, or should we assume you're largely relying on the past and we need to kind of think about? Um, think about whether we've resolved enough problems through zoning yeah. and we can move on. Yeah. Um, uh, just point of clarification. Are you talking about phase one or phase Phase two? one. Phase, phase one. one. Uh, I should probably clarify this in there since phase one is the only thing that is out at the moment. All bylaw mentioned should be kind of oriented towards phase one in this. Um, and I can clarify that a little bit. Right. Better, yeah. Um, because you know, there's a number of concerns and, zone, and suggestions about zoning. The question is, are you saying we have to do more? We didn't do enough. Oh uh, no, no. The old rules were enough. Oh uh, yeah, I'm saying I'm saying the new zoning bylaws that you guys are proposing should help solve some of the issues that are outlined in this. Yeah, okay. I can make that a little more clear. Right. If you'd like. And we're definitely going to focus on one very center. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, and encourage you to get involved too. Yeah, as we, do that. You're going to be invited to some listening sessions. Okay. So it'd be great for you guys to get involved and share some of the details. Yeah, I would love to attend those. Yeah. Do so I have a motion? I'm going to ask to endorse the strategy uh, as written with, with, with potentially some uh, um, adjustments uh, that have been noted. Well, can. Can we support it if we don't see the adjustments? <coughs> if, yes. if it's adjusted in the future? Yeah, I think if there are minor administrative um, adjustments, it's that's fine. I move that the select board endorse the econo the economic development strategic plan with uh, with adjustments in the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Thanks, Owen. We Thank appreciate you. you. Uh, I appreciate it. We have to do the voting things, but uh, it was a comment. Oh, <laughs> My other comment was right. thanks, Owen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ian? No. No. no? Okay. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Sweet. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank if you. I, I may make one more comment, uh, Kane. In terms of slight adjustments, it's like adding the state of Vermont municipal yeah. complexes. I think it was yeah. 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 a uh, clarifying question. Yeah. Data on how many uh, workers are in each facility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and could we send Plus a copy to Karen when it's completed to go on the policies, ordinances, yeah. and plans page yeah. on the town website, please? Awesome. All right. Thank Thanks, all. Thanks. 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 Okay. Next on the agenda, we have the phase two bylaw discussion. Uh, I can give an update there. And, uh, no. So originally, um, Martha Staskis, chair of the Planning Commission, was going to attend here. Um, planning Commission had met and developed a schedule for phase two, which is in your packet. Um, 
that was the plan Friday. What we've since learned is um, it's probably going to be a change of the schedule because um, town plan has to be updated every 10 years. And the last update was essentially a, a minor administrative update. So it really has been updated in quite some time. And so having learned that, um, it's likely going to rejigger the entire schedule. And so that um, that will be a bigger effort than originally anticipated, which will impact phase two. So I think um, Neil and Martha are going to go back to the Planning Commission again with perhaps some other concepts. Um, but it may include um, going to somehow have to acknowledge that and it may include um, focusing on the town plan now because you have to do it every 10 years at a minimum but you can certainly focus on it now and and that may make some sense because that would inform phase two in a major way um, so there was a schedule but I think learning that about the town plan threw a wrench into the works before it started so the best laid plans um, so I think we'll be back here at some point, I think it makes eminent sense for the select board, the planning commission, just to make sure they're on the same page about priorities before they really get deep into these efforts. Yes, it was. Um, I feel like I'm speaking a little out of turn, but I would just say I sat in on the last planning commission meeting, and one piece of this that I will just also acknowledge and um, commend the planning commission for, but also to acknowledge is that. Um, outreach and funding for that was just a piece of this scheduling conversation. So taking everything Tom said as well, um, for the last round of bylaw rewrites, we were able to get a bylaw modernization grant that paid for SE group to do the work on maps and the visual boards and a lot of the outreach materials we had. I want to say that was a $50,000 grant, so a not insignificant amount of funding to provide those materials. So I will just say, at least in this framework, part of the Planning Commission's discussion was around both wanting to update the bylaws in an expeditious manner, and if you apply for grant funding, that means you need to RFP and work with consultants in a certain timeline. So again, the Planning Commission is not presenting a recommendation, and I'm not, certainly not <coughs> presenting it on their behalf, but I think as a select board, whether it's for the town plan or whether it's for bylaw rewrite, if we want to have added capacity to do outreach, acknowledging we have full-time staff, but they also have day jobs doing planning and things. If we want outreach for a big comprehensive town plan rewrite or for a big bylaw rewrite, as of now, the mechanisms I'm aware of are we go for a municipal planning grant, which again comes with some strings around if you're lucky enough to get it, how it's administered and the timeline to apply. Um, or it's something we need to consider budgeting for. So again, they're not making an ask, I'm not presuming, but I do think just in terms of context setting for us all moving forward, it would be worthwhile to get thoughts on that when the Planning Commission does come in. And do you happen to know the funding cycle for those? So I believe it's the summer, um, but part of it had to do with even if applications are in the summer, I think grant awards and contracts last year weren't until January. There was also acknowledging that it's challenging for a consultant to be working in the middle of a rewrite or draft process. You know, if, I, if I'm the design person, I want your very final draft to put it up on a poster and sometimes doing that in the middle of, oh, what you put on a poster last week has now changed because we've gotten we public a comment yeah. Um, yeah. is a hard moment. Um, so anyway, I mean, again, just speaking like purely for myself, it was just interesting sitting in on the conversation when it felt like a lot of timeline choices were driven around well, we can or can't do that. And I'm not saying I think we need to have $50,000 in the next budget. To me, if there was five or $10,000 to do really specific, like once the very final draft from the Planning Commission is done and we need help making it more legible to the public, to me, a model like that was interesting. This is fully me editorializing on, on my own behalf, but from, from sitting in the meeting, it was just a, a piece. I think it would be at worth at least getting the Planning Commission's input in terms of what would help them do their job well, what would help us do our job well in terms of here tonight, questions about what was included in this, how do I know about it, what zone, um, and just we need support, again, whether we're providing it or whether we're able to get a grant to help us do that work. What would be a conceivable timeline for getting a new <coughs> plan? Oh, I don't want to speculate. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Throw out them. <laughs> No idea? Okay. Um, 18 to 24 months. 
two years. I think. So, and, and uh, ostensibly, part of this outreach is to get input, which would impact the plan. So we do yeah, expect yeah. that it's going to change uh, with, with input, right? Um, so I thought we might want to look at a certain amount of money to get the process started, and then perhaps more money to get more input once the draft is Yeah, my, my draft 2025 budget had a placeholder <laughs> higher than your number, so he's uh, already, you've already cut it a little bit, which is good. Okay. I, they, and again, they didn't ask. I'm not proposing on the planning version, but sitting in and listening, that kind of seems like a worthwhile investment. Okay. Um, any further discussion on this issue as of now? Yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom here again, Waterbury, I'll speak loud. Um, just because, uh, just process wise, I see group did the first phase one, right? You'd almost think it would be great if you kind of had an open <coughs> Contract, right? That worked through this, but I'm assuming RFP means it's competitive bid again, or is there a matching type requirement for the grant if you were to get one? I don't know offhand. If there is, it's it's likely. Um, I've worked with MPGs before, municipal planning grants. I forget if it matches cash or staff time, but I don't recall it being meaningful. It's certainly not. It's a far cry from one to one. Um, yeah, I think we have a good relationship with the SE group. It'd be nice to continue that. Um, I thought the public sessions where they had the, the graphics displayed added a lot of value, especially. Um, so I think it would be really nice to continue with that firm. And we've got a little money budgeted this year to continue with the firm as needed. So I'd like to keep that relationship going. I thought it was valuable. We've got an RFP at then we've got an RFP at. Any other questions on the Planning Commission Phase 2 slash Town Plan? All right, let's move forward. Uh, signs in the right of way uh, adjacent to the uh, roundabout. <coughs> yes, Tom. If I may, um, Chris Viennes was not able to make it, but he asked me to read a text for the record. Let's do it. Um, this text says, um, bit lengthy, let me get into it. Um, the cry for equal rights by a certain segment of our community has come at a cost to others who may have a difference of opinion. I feel- Can you slow down just so we can hear? Sorry. So his, his text is, the cry for equal rights by a certain segment of our community has come at a cost to others who may have a difference of opinion. I felt that after hearing from so many others about the impact of the pending potential increase in, in education tax, that it was appropriate to make the statement. After seeing several other signs supporting the budget throughout town, I felt others should be heard. As I was putting a sign up, I even considered sticking up a game camera, knowing full well the results that would come. If you take a second and read the sign, it's clear this has gone beyond educating our kids. As I said before, this is about the ability for many to simply stay in their homes. If we continue on this path, there won't be any kids to go to school because young families simply won't be able to afford to live here. I'll ask the board and anyone else in the meeting, have any of you put into question your own ability to withstand the out-of-control cost of living here and contemplated possibly leaving? I bet the answer is over overwhelmingly that you have, but I digress. The bottom line is our ability to express our opinions by banners or signs is the only privilege of a certain group, then it needs to come to an end. If it can't be fair for everyone, then it shouldn't be allowed for anyone. That's it. And I will say for context that Chris put a sign up in the roundabout, um, and it was taken down. Um, so he came in the day of the election and was upset about that. Um, so, but is his proposal uh, to not allow any signs there? Um, well, that, that's the that's the question for you. Um, is that right under the welcome to Waterbury <coughs> sign? So the the background is yeah. signs. Political signs are not allowed in a town right of way with the exception of the roundabout. Um, there's also an open question, is a vote no on a school budget a political sign? Can um, we also just be super clear about roundabout? And does it mean like in the roundabout or by the welcome sign? Because I, <coughs> I think we have very different policies for those two different areas. Um, or have enforced vastly different policies yeah. in those areas. I think it means in our right of way. 
Yeah, I was, I'm yeah. just thinking if like Lisa does one most year around elections. Mm -hmm. with. So the, the, back, the back story is that there's this little sliver of land that the welcome sign sits on that was previously owned by EFUD that they gave to the town two years ago. So it was, it was allowable to put signs of any, any sign, particularly political signs, right under the welcome sign because it was considered private property not in the purview of the town at that time. Um, and so it had been it had been allowable for a very long time for people to do that. They're not allowed to be in the roundabout. They can't be in the flowers, they can't be in the little yeah. islands of the roundabout, they, they, they will be removed. Um, however, in May, when this incident occurred with Chris, it did bring to light for me, in my role, that I really don't want to play sign police as we approach a presidential election in November, where different different individuals are placing different political signs in the roundabout, and then I'm getting calls complaining, my sign got stolen, who took it, I don't know where to find it, I paid a lot of money. So there is a, a wish from, from my perspective just say no science, because that eliminates the role that the town staff has to play yeah. in this game of people moving signs, defacing signs, stealing signs, moving signs. And those calls, I think, come to you, they come to Bill Woodruff, they come to me. Agreed. Um, not really our role. Mm -hmm. Other comments? King. I would make a comment. Uh, Sort of in opposition to what Karen said, no offense, um, that in American politics, knocking down somebody's sign or having your sign knocked down is part of the game. Right? You put up a sign, someone disagrees, they knock it down. You just put another one up, it's how it's always been. You know, people threw tomatoes at uh, Madison's signs when he put them up, right? All, all the way back. It's an American tradition to have your political <laughs> signs defaced. It's <laughs> yeah, you know? It sort of makes me feel patriotic. Yeah, right? Uh, you know, it was legal to pie the governor up until a couple years ago. So, you know, part of our American political tradition is, is signs, right? And Unless the sign is on private property and someone catches you on camera defacing a sign, the sign you know signs get defaced. It, it happens. But I don't. I agree with Karen that it's not the town's role to police. Mm -hmm. it's, it's they're political signs. If they get knocked down, just put another one up. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Tom. Do we do we actually know that signs are permitted? There was a time when you couldn't put signs. <coughs> I mean, I, I'm just asking a question. And like a man sign, I get it, right? Political event, you hey, you're waving your flag, you're waving your thing. But the sign that someone places on now, and my understanding, public property, right? That little piece. And I absolutely concur. You don't need to uh, police up the public property. It's just can a private citizen put a sign on public property? Is there a state law? Or, I know we don't even have billboards. Some of these signs just persist and they don't get picked up. Right? So, I was brought up by Public Works as well, Tom. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, I'm no, as a state, you cannot put signs in the state right away. Um, if you do, they'll be taken down by, by the agency of transportation. Um, and in the past, the, the town of Waterbury has taken them down if they're placed in a town right away. And the example of that is the roundabout. But there is that welcome sign area. Yeah, it's the exception to the rule. Well, is, well it's not on right away, right? Yeah. It's a, it belongs to the fund, it came to the town, so it's, it's part of town property, but not necessarily part of the right of way. Is that correct? <laughs> I think it's in the right of way. Yeah, we're in. <laughs> but by permitting it, could you be endorsing it would be my question. And I'm just asking that question literally because I, I believe correct in terms of 
freedom of speech, too, is the other side of that, right? If someone defaces mm -hmm. a sign, it, it's kind of a bad thing, right? If they get busted, that's an issue. Don't want the pound involved in that potential litigation, whatever might happen. But if you just said, hey, yeah, an unmanned sign is not permitted, you solve the problem. Yeah. If, if there is one, maybe, I mean, sometimes you got to find one, right? Do we really have a problem? Clearly, someone did something that was seen as somewhat egregious by one citizen, so. Right. Oh, is that? I would just like to mention I am 99% certain there is a specific state law around the types of signs allowed on public property and kind of what those signs can and cannot be. So, like, to your question, there are kind of specific guidelines around what people can put on a public property. Alyssa. Don't make me quote the regulations to the record, but on page 43 of our current adopted regulations, I would just name, and this is not addressing the um, public property, but in the current regs, there is a definition of political and campaign signs, and it says they may be displayed for not more than 14 days prior to the time of election and shall be removed within seven days following voting day. Let's go to definition. Um, a temporary sign calling, quote, <coughs> calling attention to a political event, vote, election, or candidate for public office. Um, in general, per the point around things, I feel like the best practice in town is all of our regulations have to be content neutral. So we're not telling you what you can say in the sign. We're telling you how big your sign can be and where it can be located, whether it's a sign for your local business establishment or political. We regulate, you know, and there's like oodles of case law, but like size, where it's located. This particular issue to me is a um, greatest hits of local, <laughs> local municipal government, including but not limited to lack of clear regulations, inconsistently enforced regulations, lack of ability, capacity, desire to enforce said regulations. So I guess the question for us as the board is like, what do we have anything officially on the books right now? And if so, what? And then do we have an ask from staff if we don't have something on the books to create and implement a uniform policy to take it off your plate? Um, yeah, for me, I just wanted to memorialize somewhere whether they're going to be allowed or not be allowed under the walk on sign. I'm not specifically the walk on sign. Yeah. That spot. Yeah. So just that space is just what we're that discussing. That's the only mm -hmm. space. Anywhere else, they're not going to be allowed anyway. Right. Yeah. Unless they're on private property. Yeah. Um, I will say. The utilization of that space for, for signage is an asset to the town of Waterbury. I really think engaging in political discourse is beneficial to the citizens of this town and to put that discourse, uh, or to make that public, is also beneficial to this town. I understand the ramifications of that, clearly. Um, I also think, Ken kind of mentioned, there's personal responsibility if you're putting your property in a public space, that should be your responsibility and not the responsibility of the town. Of you placing your property somewhere, I feel like is, um, to involve the town in that decision is, seems foreign to me. It just seems like that should not, um, that should be able to happen, I guess. Um, so I guess the way I think about it is, no, the town should not be, um, uh, enforcing any sort of uh, sign damage or anything to do with the signs, but I do feel like in, in you know the spirit of free speech that it is an asset to to this town. Um, I'll just say that. Um, so, might we have a motion to? Uh, Clarify the regulation allowing for the signs to be put up 14 days uh, ahead of the public event. It's currently stated in the regs, uh, but uh, clarifying that the town has no responsibility uh, for protecting uh, or placing those signs. And you're not allowed to say so moved, so it's not technical. <laughs> but, well, I mean, it, I think you know th this may require uh, a little bit uh, more careful um, drafting. So just this would just be 
a motion to draft a regulation, uh, clarify the regulation uh, to exempt the town officials from what, having to police these signs. What is the name of the regulation? For political well, signs to be placed in that particular sliver of town property. We can, we can draft that up for the July 1 meeting. Okay. Yeah. That works. Okay. I was just reading from the straight zoning regulations, not a town ordinance, just our zoning regulations. Gotcha. It is in the agenda up here. What? The signage uh, right away, and that, those same words are, this is back from 1980 something, right? But those same words are in there. Right, and I was in the just the last updated 2016 regular ones just for the definition. Down to the uh, first of July. Uh, changes to open meeting and ethics law. Um, you have an update on that? Sure. Read a, read a memo. I just sent some of the information from VLCT. Um, Open meetings, the, the simple short version is the state has, uh, the bill is signed, the state has defined um, advisory and non-advisory bodies. So you are a non-advisory body, meaning you can take legal action. So non-advisory bodies um, have to record their meetings beginning July 1 and post them uh, for 30 days. So we're working with our, with our website firm to make sure that happens. So non-advisory bodies would be the select board, the library commissioners, um, the EFUD board, um, the development review board, um, potentially the cemetery commissioners. I'm getting an opinion on that since they are elected officials. Um, I don't believe the PC um, is a non-advisory body. Um, I don't believe the Recreation Commission, Conservation Commission, any other, any other board would, would fall into that role. So it's, it's a little bit of extra work, um, not, not a huge amount of extra work. Um, just something to be aware of and make sure everyone complies with that. <coughs> and the other question I have is, um, I'll have them trying to sort out with this is, sometimes a non-advisory body is a little bit subject to interpretation of cemetery commissioners are a great example. Um, they're elected officials. They have a non-advisory role over the cemetery trust fund, but that's it. So, so their role is that um, they can spend money from the trust fund without your approval, but that's where their role ends, begins and ends. So do their, do their meetings need to be recorded and posted if there's no conversation about the trust fund? Or is it simply assumed that every one of their meetings is recorded. So I'm just getting a little clarification on that to make sure we follow it. Um, the ethics law is, is, I think, a bit more interesting. Um, one of the BLCT's major points is that um, a lot of towns already have ethics policies, which we have already. Um, and the, the changes required um, in the bill are, are unfunded. Um, but the, the biggest part is, is that essentially we have to have a process in place for um, dealing with ethic, ethics complaints as they come in, of which I've had none come in since I've been here. Um, and we've got to have an enforcement mechanism related to it. So we've got to um, designate a liaison um, to the State Ethics Commission. Um, we've got to designate that person to receive complaints. Uh, we've got to maintain uh, records related to the complaints and the disposition of how those are resolved. Um, got to have it. Got to got to change our ethics policy to have an investigation element to it, an enforcement element to it, um, and we've got to report to the state um, ethical complaints and the outcome of those complaints to the State Ethics Commission. So there's some some work for us to do here. Um, related to that, and we'll get through that, I think, early in the summer. Um, I don't think because we've got to do some of this within 30 days of July 1. So it'll be on the agenda soon. Well, if every town uh, in the state has to comply with this, then we expect that there'd be some boilerplate uh, yeah. language that we could adopt. Yeah, this is where VLCT shines. They're going to help us a lot. Uh, 
have questions for Tom on this? Okay. I had read earlier <coughs> forms of that bill, and I'm going to go ahead and assume they knocked quite a bit out because a lot of it involved, like, tax returns and <coughs> yeah, that's other, not other, other income for local and municipal officials. That's not in here. I, I don't make it a point of following the legislature all that closely unless it's a bill that, you know, something like, like our local option tax or charter. Um, I guess if I've learned one rule, and this is not a criticism of, of our legislature or any of any other legislature around the state, but um, there's enough to worry about in life. Worry about the law when it becomes a law. Mm. That's just at least my mantra. So I didn't follow the drafts all that closely. And uh, so should we uh, wait and put that on the agenda for the second meeting in July? Um, I think let's tentatively consider the first. And okay. if we need the second, we'll, we'll get there. Cool. Any further comments on this? No, we shall move. Oh, let's go ahead. Just, I mean, I don't want to be onerous to staff, but I would also say for like the cemetery commissioners, if recording the video is the only new compliance, I mean, I think it's worthwhile to get the legal opinion as you've done, but we can record the cemetery com commissioners meeting and keep it for 30 days. Um, yeah, I think it's good to have the answer. I guess I would just say, in general, most of business practices we're already doing, at least with regards to the select board. You know, mm -hmm. just to name, like this is not making us do anything wildly yeah, different in terms of we're compliant. providing electronic access, we have recordings. Um, yeah. So it's not a huge about face on that side. Um, and if we need to apply it to more boards, we can do so. And if the cemetery commission wants to defer the responsibility of their funds to the select board, <laughs> then they can can certainly do that. Thank you for the update. <laughs> sure. Um, all right, uh, comments on the local hazard mitigation plan. We have some homework on this. Uh, I did mine uh, with the able support of Neil uh, Leitner um, and went through all of the uh, issues and uh, scored each one. But uh, as I'll just open it up. How did everyone do with their homework? I put X's on the one I liked. <laughs> I didn't rate each one on a scale of one to three for viability, but I did the, pick the one. The scale is actually quite odd. It was one, one, plus one, one, zero, and minus one. Yeah, yeah. but, a, but one, two, one, three. Two. I mean, hard. Um, one per category. Um, but we can also just send them to Tom and get them compiled. I guess I had one question around several seemed like things we're already doing, you know, like in terms of incorporating things into town planning, upsizing, culverts. Um, there were some I wish we didn't have to pick one. Like, do we need to retrofit critical facilities to strengthen them to withstand high wind or bury power lines or require new subdivisions to bury power lines? Didn't love those options, but. Yeah. Uh, well. I think I voted negative one on both of them. <laughs> <laughs> and the wind ones didn't seem to be, as of yet, a major concern that the climate is changing. So, it will be a quite an interest to go in the season. And would this also be a July 1 or July 15th for adoption based on input? Um, do we as soon as we can. Hearing? Okay. I'm sorry, I need to get in yeah. we, we, we are on 755, comments on local hazard mitigation plan. Tom, via? Yeah. Alyssa is suggesting that she could submit the uh, comments that she made on the um, spreadsheet. Yeah, we all are. We all yeah. send Tom our spreadsheets. Yeah, we all have different spreadsheets. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone was given the same spreadsheet, but they were supposed to score it differently. Okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood that. <laughs> and for those following at home, the spreadsheet is just a list of the proposed action items that were in the draft that was on our last list. list. Okay. It is quite large. Okay. Yeah. Understanding that one in each category needs to be prioritized for the plan. And they wanted select board input on that. Okay, so uh, can we set ourselves a deadline for submitting uh, our input? When is it due? As soon as possible. Yeah, we're so. sort of due today, but uh, you know, I know how it works. How about by Friday at time? I like that. I'll remind everyone who hasn't. Okay. Thanks, Mr. President. Okay, so we will have uh, input for that uh, for Friday, and then uh, Tom and Neil can look to uh, collate uh, those responses and come up with a combined response, does that sound reasonable? Yep. Okay, good. Unless there's any further comment on that, we will move forward uh, with the uh, set the tax rate. Um, issue a uh, summary of uh, the tax on this. Yep, I sent an email out on, this was on the packet. Actually, the numbers changed to the, like, the fourth decimal place today because okay. there was literally one, one grievance hearing that was finalized. Let me, excuse but me, Tom, for to, just a second, Roger does this. So I had already pre-printed your packets. They were back to back, so I couldn't just easily take out a page and put in the page. Mm -hmm. So instead, I stapled the one Tom brought me late this afternoon to the top of the oh, one. Okay, okay. okay. sorry yeah. about that. It's no, my it's yeah. it's it's so. Not reprint the whole pack yet. So, All right. so you may or may not even need the, the under one because it is the previous one. Okay, a little mm -hmm. bit of background. Sorry. So the long and short is using the um, using the the at the warning and town meeting day the there was a tax rate approved by the voters of fifty five point seven cents. Mm -hmm. um, that was a maximum rate approved. If that rate is adopted, we have a surplus of nearly $40,000, which is great. Um, the tax rate at the time was based on historical Grand West growth. The Grand West grows historically around a percent a year, so I estimated the tax rate assuming seven tenths of a percent, which was the lowest it's grown in the past eight or ten years, uh, but that was safe. Um, so the Grand West had a better year. Um, so there's a surplus, $39,902. That being said, um, we have um, three vacant properties that are in the FEMA buyout process that received a, um, an, a tax abatement last year. Um, it's up to the um, Board of Civil Authority to issue a tax abatement, but it, it seemed to me that the conditions that caused that taxes to be made of last year persist Correct. this year. So that's it's in the range of ten grand. Um, so I think you should give yourself somewhat of a cushion. Mm -hmm. But that being said, um, you could split the difference um, and lower the tax rate. Is it a lot of money? Um, if you use the voter approved tax rate um, for a home fight of $300,000, the, um, the increase is uh, $39.30. If you reduced, um, if you reduce the tax rate to knock that surplus down by ten by $10,000, um, the tax rate, the tax increase for a person of that $300,000 home would go down by about four bucks. So is it Meaningful to any one person in any one year, that's that's your call, not mine. Um, what I what I've kind of been trained in local government and what I've what I've learned is I think a good principle is no one can work miracles, no one wants tax increases, but if you can beat the rate of inflation consistently over a period of time, you're gonna do some good. So you know going from 2.41% to 2.18%, 
is not a huge amount of money in this year, but if you do that every year for five years, you know, you've done something. Um, so you've got a surplus to work with. Um, it's a your call how you want to work with it, if at all. Well, one consideration would be uh, what we're anticipating for the following year. And I know you don't have a magic ball in front of you, but you do have some ideas about what we might be looking at uh, in 2025 in terms of some paving initiatives and other things that you have in mind. And you've got another <coughs> fire truck. Um, and uh, I think, from my standpoint, what we want, one goal is to have uh, consistency. We don't want to drop the tax rate precipitously, and you're not, I'm not suggesting that, but even to drop it a bit this year and then have to face a larger increase the following year could meet with uh, taxpayer um, discomfort. Yeah. So. I've always got a year's draft budget ahead. There's a lot of, um, you know, I'll go Don Rumfeld on you. There's a lot of known unknowns in there. Um, Thanks for saying that. Uh, that was for Tom Gore's book. Yeah, that was a disappointment. But uh, a lot of that depends on the local option tax, and, mm -hmm. and not just the local option tax in 2025, but the unanticipated local option tax this year. Um, mm -hmm. There is some. There is some debt that is on the books and goes away in the next few years, but if it's prepaid, you have a pretty big impact on spending next year. Um, so that's one of the big variables for 2025 is what you want to do with the local option tax this year. But I don't see any, any major headwind that would cause us to have to have a budget that has a tax increase I, I would say, you know, if the current rate of inflation is around four, that would be a, I think, a very high increase given the given the resources available. I, I, I would say that, um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to pigeonhole myself too much, but I, you know, the goal is the goal is with the local option tax to give you a very palatable draft budget that has no tax increase, and I don't think that hinders the town long term. Other questions? Mr. Gore's question. Oh, yes. question I always wait for this question. Tom Gore, whatever um, insignificant good term. I, my question is more along the lines of uh, I think you're working on a three year kind of quick look at budget. Um, we all know what happened this year with education. We shouldn't be slaves to the education budget when we plan our municipal plan and what we do here, right? Payton's important, all these things that are governmental responsibilities for the town. Education's in the side. They're going to work through that, I guess. I don't know, but if you didn't know, the governor's vetoes were overrun, so the tax rate is what it is, right? So we're all going to see that. Um, I would just ask maybe, as you draw out that three-year plan that you bring in our school board representatives uh, and have them kind of brief status of that financial plan they keep talking about. They have their own committee now um, because I kind of predict the education budget is going to be what it's going to be and it, people are going to be concerned, right? I mean, rate of inflation is one thing, but 14%, I mean, that was this year and it's solid now. So I think the select board should get updates from our representatives on the school board because they are our vote there, right? I mean, as this kind of plays out, your, your fiscal plan next year is going to be again impacted by how their plan works out. And then to the point of the three-year plan, kind of think that bond vote is going to come back again at some point in time. So, Fire trucks are interesting. Uh, these are big bills coming. So I'm not advocating you do anything with this one. I think you're smart to maybe consider it a bit of a windfall. 
because it's not that big, as you said, but uh, impacts of that other big bill are going to crush people. And uh, it, it just is what it is at this point. So maybe I would just say, the well, last comment, when I talk to their CFO, they do a five-year plan. So I know that's hard in a town, but it may be worth looking at their five-year plan uh, to see where we would be in those same kind of five years. Another fire truck in year four? I don't know. Thank you. Sir. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes, Ken. I'm going to go ahead and say that if we're looking at 10,000 with the tax payments, bringing us down to 30K, there's no reason not to just pump that back into the general fund. So just keep it as the voted by the taxpayer? Yeah. Proposal. Yeah, I'll um, can I speak to that? Sure. Um, I'm saying, yeah, I'm going back and forth. I do, I do like the idea of um, splitting the difference and giving a little bit back to um, the taxpayers, but I do also feel like it's not a usually significant amount. Um, I guess my question is, you know, what is putting this all back into the general fund uh, and weighing that against the goodwill of the taxpayers, against the select board, with the select board, saying, you know, they're really doing us a solid, but again, the, the small amount of money, I don't know how much goodwill this, this does buy us. Um, and I guess that's what I'm kind of floating between right now. Thirty grand will do a lot for potholes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Name your potholes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we're talking about a tremendous amount of money either yeah. way. Um, but we do have to make a decision. So um, we could uh, ask Tom to set the bill to drop it. To twenty thousand dollars. I do think that we're going to experience a bit of a windfall with the uh, local option tax going in six months earlier than anticipated. Uh, and that should buy, you know, render us uh, another three hundred thousand dollars, which is not budgeted for. And, uh, could help us uh, with some fill some budgetary holes, pay off some debt, pay for some housing initiatives. Wait, so are you su suggesting that we use that, the, the incoming local option tax, along, along with this, or handing this back? No, I'm just saying that I don't think uh, that we have, we're in, uh, taking a big risk by drop. If we were to say, let's drop uh, the anticipated tax by $20,000, I, I don't think that that is uh, incurring undue risk, because I do think that we're going to see additional uh, revenue by the end of the year. Absolutely. I don't think 30 grand is going to you know, blow our tires out if we get it back to, to, to funds. Tom's also saying that due to the uh, ongoing local option tax that we could be looking at further, uh, keeping, keeping the tax rate relatively low, so we wouldn't anticipate a huge increase the following year either. So if we were to give the taxpayers a certain amount of a break. Maybe it's only going to be in the neighborhood of $10 on their $300,000 home. Uh, but it's something uh, in face of a 14% jump on our friends uh, in, this, uh, in the education tax department. Do you want to come back? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, sir. Just local option tax, Tom. I understand the legislature passed uh, powering down that decision to towns now. I don't know if that passed or not this legislative session, but we're in, we're good to go. But as other towns kind of do it as well, my understanding is that pot of money goes from here down a little bit smaller because they do have 
it's all shared, right? It goes so to the state, then it comes. Seventy percent is retained, but it goes to the town directly. Thirty percent goes to the okay. state, but that, that goes into what's called the pilot fund. Okay. Pilot is paid out to towns that have state. Okay, so we still benefit off. So we actually are benefit quite a bit. Disproportionately. Okay, so that won't impact more towns. Don't impact that. Yeah, and the, the pilot is legal. The pilot is based on the, on the insurance value of the buildings. Okay. And I thought here I made sure they ask our lister, hey, the state doesn't pay taxes anyway, let's just jack up their value and get more pilots. <laughs> I'm not the first person to ask that question. Okay. Thank you. Elizabeth. I'm just clarifying this <coughs> top sheet with the yep. 20K surplus is in consideration of today's grievance hearing? Yes. That's correct. So this projected 20K surplus accounts for? So that'd be the accounts for meeting the budget as budgeted, accounting for these abatements, the grievance, and that we still would anticipate a twenty thousand dollars surplus. Not accounting for the abatement, so that's just okay. that's just twenty. So with that, accounting for the abatements be about ten. Okay. Anyone care to make a motion? I was trying to figure out how to word it. So what we need clarity on for a motion is, is <laughs> there's technically three rates that have to be adopted. Yeah. Um, the, the base tax rate, the veterans exemption rate, the Hunger Mountain exemption rate, the, the veterans and the Hunger Mountain are formulaic. Um, so the... Um, The adopted uh, tax rate is the um, the fifty the fifty five point seven or the point five five seven zero was the maximum rate approved by the voters in town meeting day. Mm -hmm. So if you went down to the point five 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 eight, that'd give you a thirty thousand dollars surplus, not accounting for the potential ten in abatements that again I suggest are, are reasonable and likely to consider. So you know, then you'd be at a 2.18% increase for the year if you want to go down to a $20,000 surplus again, minus a 10, so we're a $10,000 surplus. You would be at um, that 55.45, which would be a 1.95% tax increase for the year. That sounds like a good one. Yeah. Or since you're in a good position, you can pick your number. Uh, let's, say, let's make it point five 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 zero to round it off. Okay. So is the motion as simple as setting that as the tax rate? Setting that as setting setting so the rate. I will make a motion to set the tax rate at point five 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 zero. No, it's right in the middle. Five 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 zero. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion. Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Well, unless you wanted to. I'm just. No, I mean, to me, I think it's prudent that we allow some savings. All of Tom's projections accounted for 10k in excess, which to me feels like a reasonable buffer while delivering below 2% increase. So I was going to move for 5545. Five, five. Uh, well, the 5550, five, I think, is a little higher than the 5545. Five. So at oh, point sorry. five 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 oh, zero. Oh, he's splitting. Okay. At 0 .5550, you'd be raising four million four hundred twenty-six thousand. No, that's fine. I misunderstood. Five five zero seven. So you would still have a twenty-four thousand dollars surplus and take off the ten okay. abatements. Yep. Mm -hmm. And your increase at point five 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 zero would be basically two percent on a penny on the dot. All right. So we still have a motion. It's been seconded. For the discussion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we have a new tax rate. And look at that, we don't have taxes. <laughs> Do you need the others? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need the others. The veterans exemption is, is veterans can qualify for an exemption um, 
on the first thirty thousand dollars of the property, the town approved that some Thank years back. <laughs> um, so, so essentially, um, everyone else has to pay a little more because of that. You've got to raise um, about fourteen thousand five hundred dollars to cover that cost. That rate is point zero zero one nine. Cost a typical house five dollars and fifty six cents a year. Hunger Mountain is a similar story that was approved um, several years back. Um, that's actually a little bit more expensive. That's sixteen thousand and forty two. So it's point zero zero two one. Um, those two things cost the average homeowner about twelve twelve bucks even per year. Um, I would like to interrupt. Mike has joined us on the team. Hey, Mike. House fishing. He's, he's muted. Oh, he's muted. Oh, Mike, you gotta unmute. Oh, he's got three hands. <laughs> That's what he gets for fishing in Lake Champlain. Uh, is that as a separate rate, right? Yes. So it gets. Okay. Um, and then the veterans exemption is disabled veterans, so it's not yeah. that you serve. And therefore, you get a discount. Hmm. So you're still paying. What's that? You're, you're still paying. Well, it, it is. You. It, it just. It's. There are more veterans than there are disabled veterans, right? If you serve right. three years, you don't come forward and say, "Hey, I get this discount too." Just for context, when it says veterans discount, you you could have someone read it and say, "Well, I served three years in the army." It's that's not the same. You petition the state for. And then it's a one-time petition that it carries forward. Yeah, there's 22 of that in the town. 22 disabled. All right. Um, what's your pleasure on the uh, veterans uh, exemption? It's uh, currently proposed at 0019. I was just looking at last year's minutes to see if we structured it. I have those. Oh, okay. I think they were in the packet, weren't they? No, they were in my packet. Yeah. I was going to say I was pulling last year. So is that zero zero one nine off their tax bill? No. No. no that's it's why it's, it's a separate it's, rate. It's, it's applied to rate. the other taxpayers to compensate. To, to compensate. Yeah. There's the last two years. And the net result is an additional twelve dollars to the average taxpayer. Well, between veterans and hunger mountain, it's twelve dollars. Right. The two combined doesn't amount to a lot, but we do have to make a decision. Oh, you did them all. I would like a, a history lesson at some point in the hunger mountain rate. It involved a legal settlement. A legal settlement. Yes. Settlement. <laughs> settlement. I can um, give you the thirty-second version. So um, I know we covered it. <laughs> unlike Cliff. Unlike Cliff. Cliff was, in, was granted last year tax exempt status, which effectively means, from a grandma's perspective, they're not on it. They're right. not part of any of these counties. So. Hunger Mountain was given a partial exemption, so they were exempt from municipal taxes, um, but, but they are not exempt from school taxes. And so um, the town has to collect those taxes to pay to the school. Sorry, they, they were given a school exemption. Um, we have to collect those taxes and pay them to the school district, so everyone else pays a little more for that. The net effect, in fact, um, is the same as if they were just off the grand list. It just wouldn't be a separate line on gotcha. the tax bill. Okay. Do we have a motion for uh, the veterans, uh, disabled veterans tax exemption? I move to add a tax rate of 0 .0019 to couple the to cover the disabled veterans exemption. And that's where it is now. It's it was 0017 last year. It has to do with the grand list, gotcha. what covering the taxes that we need to. But it, this the wording from last year was um, a motion to add a tax rate of 0 .0017 cents for Hunger Mountain and the exemption. Gotcha. The second okay. pass. But you Putting, setting it at the 0019 for this year? Correct, for the veteran. Okay, we'll have a second. second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Any abstentions? Mike, did you vote? Uh, now we have to add money back in. Um, so we're, uh, I'll entertain a motion for the Hunger Mountain, uh, uh, an additional tax to cover the Hunger Mountain uh, exemption. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Oh, move to set the tax rate yeah. for Hunger Mountain, the Hunger Mountain rate at zero point zero zero two one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Mike, did you hear all that? Mike. Yes, I did. Okay. No further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Okay. And then that the, passes. the final tax issue, nothing in your packet, but um, there's um, there are late homestead exemption filers every year, and by by state law, um, you are permitted to apply a penalty. Um, for that, um, up to 8%. The, the, the penalty was set at 2% last year. This is 2022. Um, and that's because when there is a late homestead file, the town has to send the bill again. So there's not a ton of work, but there's a little bit of work related to that. Um, so last year, the board felt that some fee was appropriate. Mm -hmm. Karen, you had a, I think, a strong opinion on that last year. Maybe not. I always have strong opinions. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you have a strong opinion this year? Um, I don't know how strong it is. I think that a penalty is appropriate. Um, there is a, quite a bit of staff time. I, I wish that it didn't have to be a percentage, but that's a greater conversation. We can't make it a flat fee, so we have to make it a percentage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Bill Shefflock years ago to lower it to 2% based on what Dan was able to provide us as the average uh, taxable value of most of the homes in Waterbury. Um, so, and I can't recall all the numbers that we used, but basically it came down to 2% being around $50 so that we felt like we were, it wasn't egregious um, but it covered, <coughs> at that time, Dan touching it, Michelle touching it, me touching it, and then it going in the mail for collection where it's touched again. So $50 felt like a reasonable sum for these late filings, and that's why we lowered it from 8% to 2% years ago. Just like we did that in 2022 and 2023. Nice. Mm -hmm. You just want to keep it at 2? I think it's quite reasonable. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't lobby for it to be less or more, frankly. I think two is appropriate. So we have a good number. Do I have a motion? I move to keep the late filing penalty at 2%. Is that correct? Is that a correct motion? Yeah. Homestead. For the homestead. The homestead, yeah, declaration. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That two passes at two percent. Okay. And with that, I believe we have set the tax rate. Parking ordinance. Preliminary discussion. Mm. Um, did send out a Parking study. Karen did. Oh, Karen did. Thank you. And our 87 page. Yeah. You 
you won't find all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the parking, the parking study was done really, I think, in anticipation of losing 51 South Main Street. Right. Um, what I will just add for context, it's not in the study, but there's a there's a general rule on parking about, and, it's, and it pertains to the size of the city or town you're going. If you're going to Waterbury and you want to go to the reservoir, you get a little upset if you can't park right there. If you're going to New York City, finding a parking spot is like finding a gold nugget. You park wherever you park and you figure it out from there. The smaller the town, the closer you want to be, you expect to be. Um, so. I do get occasional complaints about parking, probably once a month. Um, and it's never on night to find parking, and so I had to walk a block or two, which is, which is very definitely a small town problem. The other complaint I get, which is not part of it, is the, the, the tickets and fees on the private lots, but not, not something we can, we can address. No, the, 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 the fees and Penalties for those private lots are yeah. egregious. Um, I guess the other, for context, the other complaint I get about the winter parking ban, um, you know, we do get people towed on occasion. We, we try generally um, to not enforce it until after Thanksgiving. Um, and we try generally to tell the tow operator that if it's a mild winter that like last winter, don't worry about it a whole lot. But you, you can only do that so much because then you condition people to park where they're not supposed to, and then when it does snow, we can't clear it easily. So we try to be good about it. Um, you know, people people yeah. can call and request a waiver, and we've done that on occasion. We had a lady last year. I, I think that I think the call was something about a home birth, and you know, her her doula and her mother, or something like that. And, you know, we relate that. Um, so we, we just try to use some discretion from a staff perspective, um, since you know many of those complaint, many of those people tell come right back to us with a complaint. I, I guess in general, I think the winter parking ban works fine. You know, some towns do have an other other side of the street. Um, I think it's more work if we were to do that, more work for public works crew. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't get a. I don't get a sense that anything needs to change from that from a winter parking perspective. That's just my impression. I could be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, in the parking study from uh, a couple of years ago indicated that there were still uh, spaces available that we are not even tapped out. Yeah, even without 51 South Main Street, the supply still right. beats the demand by almost 100. And I don't have an answer, but I have reached out to the to the Wesley Church um, to consider um, having their lot become public parking at least some of the time. And part of that was in relation to the conversation about getting a handicapped space mm -hmm. downtown. I um, just don't have an answer to that yet, but that obviously it's a church. It wouldn't be public parking probably from Saturday evening uh, through to Monday. Uh, I did get uh, an email uh, from Sandy about parking on Ducktail. Sandy, would you like to address that? Yeah, um, I know the, the Zen Barn, every once in a while, has an event that over their parking lot gets full, and people park alongside of Guptel Road, and it's a very narrow road as it is, and emergency vehicles come through, and there's no place to go. They have signs there that says towing, you're going to be towed, if, you know, but nobody, it's not being enforced and, you know, I mean, I have nothing against the Dunbar because I like it, but it's just, there, something needs to happen because it's, it's just not working having a line of cars parked on the side of the road. And they're in the road, I mean, they're not even off the road because you really can't. Uh -huh. Well, I know, um, and we did address this last year, uh, and we did put up no parking signs on that corner where the road is a little bit tighter and there's really not any space to park uh, off-road. Off um, and at least for a while, it seemed as though they were enforcing that, and that people were parking 
between the Zen barn and the bridge <coughs> over uh, Badger Brook, where there is enough room to park off the pavement. Um, uh, we could uh, address that with the owners. Um, I mean, they have the signs go there, but they're not even, they're, not, they're pointed so you can't even see them. And, hmm. I mean, I, and they were good for a while, yeah. but it, it, you know, it's just in the last few months, it's just come around. Yeah, they've had, like, couple, they've had a couple big shows. Yeah. Big yeah. acts roll through, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know. I mean, I don't know if they could speak to even one of the neighbors and let them, you know, see if they can charge to have them park there. I don't know. It's just, it's uh -huh. just hard, especially like I said with emergency vehicles, and it's bad enough there on the corner. Right. <coughs> well, um, I'd be happy to, to talk with the owners uh, and see, because I know that we, we had that conversation and they said we're, we're going to put up signs, that we'll be enforced, and for at least a while it was. Uh, so maybe it's just a question of getting back to them on that. Uh, those really crowded uh, corridors when they have those huge shows, it's only happened two or three times this year, I think. Wow. Right? Yeah, the, when it both sides of the streets are lined with cars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely warrants a conversation, but it's not like an every night thing. You know? No, no, it's not, but it only takes once. Right. Yeah. I, I think about it um, a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, part of my, my thinking is you know, in a few weeks we'll be collecting an additional tax on, on all those sales. And, you know, it's a typical road. I know they're they're limited because behind the Zen barn it's all wetland, so they can't they can't add parking if they wanted to. Right. You know, I'm wondering if I can talk to Bill Woodruff and if there's a way to somehow expand the expand the edge of the road to fill it in with gravel, or you know, we might need to do some culverts to allow some parking for them because I feel like we're taking more tax revenue from your operations we're benefiting directly from that maybe we should enable your business a little bit some of that revenue and if there's i don't think we can be miracle workers but maybe we can find you know a few feet might be enough to get them off the road make room for vehicles um, mm -hmm. and does the town own a sufficient right of way that's that something happen? i have to look into that's part of the part of the question okay let's take a look at I that think the, um, I think the golf course actually owns, if I'm not... The wetland? Yeah. I think right. they might, regardless, you can't, you can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, in the town, the town road, there's a certain width of right of way, which usually surpasses the, the paved area. Like quite a bit. Yeah. I don't know if you can do the same conversation, but you don't golf at night, so maybe there's an idea there where if someone approached country club to see if you could park up that road and alleviate some of the pain because Sandy's right I, I mean everybody kind of lets it go but the place does sell alcohol right so at some point in time we could have a tragedy there that nobody wants it it's, it's less of probably a concern of the inconvenience it's a safety issue that is a narrow road so if you're going to do what you're going to do but maybe to be proactive and see if maybe the country club would allow a partnership. They're also um, that I'm assuming will be paying the local option tax. Maybe they see it as a win-win. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Check that out. Mike. Bart. Yep. The, the problem I think is it was a good move that they put those signs up. But I don't really know if they're really if, if they're enforcing it in terms of towing people away, and that's where it becomes kind of an issue. If yeah, it's nice that you have signs, but if it's not being enforced and people keep on doing it, you know, I hate to kind of you know you don't want to see a business you know in in you know affect their their business, but then also public safety comes in into to matter because that's just such a dangerous curve and you know it's just going to take one time where there's going to be a bad act there that it's going to really reflect bad upon both Zenbarn and the town yeah. so i don't know i don't know what's a good solution they made this tried to make a solution 
by putting up signs, but you know, without some sort of enforcement, you know, it's not going to do any good. Okay. Well, uh, again, I'll just repeat myself. Uh, I did talk to them a year ago. They put up the signs. They were enforcing it for a certain measure of time. Uh, I don't think it would hurt to have another conversation with them, uh, and then also we could uh, explore some of these other options uh, and uh, see where we get. Can I say something, please? Yes. Lisa Walton. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that I think that the idea of singling out the Zen barn and putting taxpayer money towards that when we don't do it for other businesses may create an issue with other businesses. So it seems to me that the Zen barn could look at maybe shuttling people to another parking lot somewhere. Um, you know, but it seems that the responsibility should be on the Zen barn and not the taxpayers to fund that. Uh, okay, okay. I was going to make a similar recommendation. They do own another business just down the road with an ample parking lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alyssa. And I, true to form, was going to quote the regulations, <laughs> which <laughs> mentioned parking not less than 61 times in our current water gray zoning regulations dated 5-16-16. Um, and we'll acknowledge, I did not do my piece of homework, which is acknowledge a piece of this is that there was also a village parking ordinance. So in the, having a comprehensive discussion about this, the minutes I have right now are from Chris Tagatak in the Cork space, which is 2017, um, where there was an allocation of on-street parking, which has done been done approximately eight times. So we're just stacking them in the on-street spaces. So yeah. obviously it's not happening since we no longer have trustees and EFUD is not doing anything with parking, but I guess to me, more than specific businesses, the question would it be, besides what's currently in section 414 around parking that the development review board decides and it either works or doesn't, um, do we need to do anything else in downtown or elsewhere or is this all taken care of in the update? Um, and I guess that's maybe a planning commission adding to the three things <laughs> that we're looking at next week. Which is to say, do we think our current zoning regulations are requiring enough parking for each of our type of business in each of the relevant districts? Mm -hmm. um, and if they aren't, is that a regulatory change, you know, versus this kind of one-off? Yeah, I, I guess my understanding is that the this new uh, set of zoning regs put less emphasis on parking. Right. Uh, and I'll admit that I may not have read that section in detail, but maybe we need to do that uh, just to see where we are because the, those new regs are currently in place, right? Some of that was mirror, was just a bit of mirror state law, state law now, mm -hmm. that did the same. Right. So the and the property. Phase one has no parking discussion in it at all. Right. We didn't change anything in phase one. Is that, is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah, we didn't touch it. So there's nothing in the new regs. <coughs> the 414 is what applies. 414 stays as written. Okay, so maybe Which is section that. 414, page 19 of Waterbury Zoning Regulations, parking regulations, which has all sorts of math about how many spots you have to require based on use and number of employees. And you can use off-site parking if you have a written agreement. You can also get permission from a municipal body. Now that would just be us, and we're not really doing that. Um, there's ways the development review board can approve less, but yeah, just to say like mm -hmm. this portion of town was not in phase one anyway, so it's covered by this. Well, Zenbar's not. In right, that's what I'm saying. Right. So I'm saying yeah. like even but, if with phase one they're adhering. But to that. I do think it is a little problematic uh, that they didn't address parking because the the guidebook that they were following says you need to address parking and stop requiring all these parking uh, requirements because it uh, decreases the amount of housing. So, we got something to do. <laughs> Some of that's addressed in state law and I think the DRB has already made a ruling or two okay. related to that. So. So, this is just the first year. So. <laughs>
Right, I was going to say, so in the putting it all out on the table, we have what's currently in 414, we have whatever zombie rounds <laughs> are or are not currently being enforced, and we have what we want to see in the future. So one other point we did, maybe we need to learn from it, we stopped regulating changes of use. So if you have one permitted use, let's say you have a house, and you're allowed to make a business, you don't have to get a new permit for it. We didn't think about was one may require one car, yes. and one may require five cars. I, mean, I guess I personally didn't think about it that way <coughs> in terms of these sort of ancillary effects of the change in use. So something to keep in mind when it comes to parking and changes of use. Right, and I guess I would say like per the best practices that I think you're alluding to, Roger, I think there's an understanding in a walkable downtown. There is general publicly available parking, and instead of going through a charade of saying, your restaurant has eight spots and mine has 12, and it is presumed there is enough to meet the need overall, like how the parking sure. study indicates, and that we don't need to say, Billy, you've gone from a cafe to this. Because I will say, when I was in ONC as the economic development director, that's why I know about these, because it was like, go to the DRB and now please go to the trustees and get the sign off for your 21 parking spaces and it was just weird and everyone involved acknowledged it was weird so mm -hmm. it, yeah if we're not doing it do we get rid of it um, did the DRB comment on it I'm trying to, I know you got input from them with regards to the rewrite and I'm wondering if it came up as like a I don't think they asked us to address parking if that perfect. Question. yeah yeah right. they were looking at the paper that was before them, yeah. mm -hmm. not what they, you know. And now Eric Chittenden is stacking cars on boats. <laughs> <laughs> Things have gone out of hand. I just got a, I got a frame for that picture. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, so it sounds like maybe we revisit with the planning commission, or is there, I mean, there's the individual uh, we'll case. With them, that's uh, that's what I'm saying. Should we stack Martha's agenda when she's here? Yeah, let's, let's stack this. Unprompted? Mm -hmm. but maybe they, they just confirm and I'll follow up on the course. zombies because that was my homework and I forgot. Zombie okay. Ordinance. Any further discussion on parking? All right. Thank you. We'll move on. Uh, noise concerns. Second discussion. My husband's stud finder for the wall. Yeah, it's yeah. a little handheld thing with a microphone on it. Mm -hmm. Batteries. Nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. Had a camera with it. Not attached to it, but just in the bag. Um, no idea why. Yeah. Uh, I guess if we need one, we have one. As I recall, yeah. I can look at my notes. Um, we're visiting this because of some complaints we heard about a party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's a party. About this time of year, about uh, three years ago. And, uh, and, and some hooligans at 51 South Main Street and concerts in the park. Just the park, yeah. And then, since then, I've, uh, someone has asked me about uh, can we put up a sign asking or informing the trucks that uh, using their jake brakes uh, coming down the ramp from 89 is not allowed. Or through the middle of town, which has been happening more frequently. Mm -hmm. And what I've heard about that is that uh, the uh, V-Trans will not allow us to uh, put up such signs, but maybe that's not true. I, I, I was not able to verify that. I just watched this uh, documentary on sound pollution in uh, Vermont, made by a uh, Stowe filmmaker. And uh, the conclusion there was that a uh, number of people were upset about it, but that uh, V-Trans thinks of it as a safety issue, 
the trucks need to be allowed to use their jig brakes to uh, slow down. Shin. So to, there oh. is a sign in stow that says no engine brakes. Please do not use your engine with brakes. It's on the stow property. It's not on the V trans, but it's where hmm. just by the police station. Okay. Um, maybe the word please maybe. makes it okay. Yeah, yeah maybe please. Please. <laughs> please. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. By the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So certain yeah. people feel better. Yeah. I was I was going to ask. Sure, V Trans could tell us no on an exit ramp. Correct, right? Especially a downhill exit ramp yeah. uh -huh. coming off the highway. Sometimes they need to use their engine brakes. If they have to pump those brakes on Main Street, they're going way too fast, uh -huh. and they need to slow down. <clears throat> so I wonder if it's a different set of. Uh, regulations on the state level for engine brake use in a downtown. Uh, well, I can uh, put in an inquiry uh, with V Trans. See who the uh, regulator in charge of uh, Jake Brakes is. The, the Jake Brakes are? I'm sure they, that exists. <laughs> we can't be the only town that doesn't care for Jake Brakes. Yeah, listen. And then I guess so that's once the, in terms of general level setting, I feel like we have a better sense here. The entertainments that we permits we approve from Karen do specify a decibel limit on um, the they? standard ones. I'm pretty sure it says 80. I keep trying to pull a blank form and I can't. Remember 82. Yeah, 80 or 85. There is a statewide noise ordinance after 10 p.m., is that correct? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. Yeah, I believe there's a statewide. So I guess the question for our board is, do we see a need and or desire to create an additional sound ordinance for Waterbury? And portraying my own belief, what would be the enforcement mechanism of that one, which personally I don't think we have. Um, but it so feels like a juncture. Can I add an addendum to your thought? Please do. Uh, okay. okay. Um, would we then require a permit to <clears throat> I guess break is the wrong word but I'm gonna use it break the noise ordinance like if someone's having an event mm -hmm. and push past a certain time go you would have to apply for, for an exemption yeah yeah exemption that's mm -hmm. a, that's a much better word <laughs> and I guess I should say I was just posing the question for discussion of the board like do we even want to create such a thing and speaking for myself I don't it's not the top of my list and yeah. I don't think we have an enforcement mechanism so just personally I think there is an existing state noise ordinance we institute noise limits for certain mm -hmm. Entertainment permits, the bylaws do have some specific use standards about how long they have to be at the edge of the property. So personally, I feel like that's giving us some good baseline coverage for the time being. Mm -hmm. Personally, for me off the cuff, it's not high on my priority list. Um, but I, that, I, you know, that's me. I don't know how the rest of the board feels. Per the point of who's regulating, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would entertain a motion to table the conversation. Um, and Mike, Mike has his hand up. Mike. Yeah, as, as much as I'm very understanding of people on Main Street, you know, with the whole Jake Craig issue, but the problem I, I see is that even even if you had something that you said, you know, no Jake breaks, I'm questioning, you know, even if someone would a uh, trucker would use shake brakes. You know, on a level of enforcement. You know, I don't know. If, I don't know if we have any ability to be the sound police that you you know court in and enforce or something like that. So, are we do something? Like well. Yes, okay. Uh, two meetings with the commanding officer of the state police or whoever they sent, uh, I can't remember which officer it was, said if you, you have to make rules for us to enforce. Right, that was the lieutenant. Yeah. Um, and so if we can. 
find out if we, if we can even make a rule, VTrans will let us, then we have a rule for the state police to enforce. Mm -hmm. So there's our enforcement mechanism. Mm -hmm. I guess we could also find out uh, whether the state police uh, also is de uh, <coughs> um, obliged to enforce the, the state uh, ordinance. Yeah, I understand if, if, if we have an ordinance, that's all fine, but it, it, it's, it's going to be so selective that you know, I, uh, one of the troopers is going to have to be there and kind of, to me, witness something. And I just don't know how often that's going to happen, you know. And, you know, I know I wouldn't be too happy, you know, where when we were uh, in the LCI, you know, across the river, you know, is, is a big train line. And, and you hear the in the middle of the night, the, the, the train whistles going like crazy. I said, if I lived there, it'd, it'd be crazy. But, you know, and I'd probably not like it, but probably for safety, they have to blow those whistles. So I just don't know with, you know, if if we did have to even some, enforce, you know, an enforcement regulation, would something honestly really happen to change the behavior? Yeah, yeah I guess the, the only thing I'd say, Mike, um, I worked in a different place once, and, and they didn't have a noise ordinance. They had police. There was one local, there was one neighbor to neighbor issue where someone got up for work at 5 a.m. And, and drove, you know, one of those crazy loud motorcycles and, and loved to rev his engine at 5 a.m. And so an, emer an emergency ordinance was passed just to deal with essentially that one issue. And, and you know, I, I, I'm with Alyssa, I hate ordinances that don't have an enforcement mechanism. But that's the argument for passing an ordinance, that if you if you have it on the books and you have that one specific bad offender, the state police can respond to that. Well, but the- Totally agree. And the, but the state already has an ordinance, according to Alyssa, uh, of I know, and, um, uh, so. And we have a decibel meter if they want to use it, right? <laughs> um, for the purposes of our agenda, I will move that we continue the noise concerns conversation at our July 15th meeting mm -hmm. to discuss information regarding the potential for signage for truck traffic, and if that's allowable. Mm -hmm as well as the state noise ordinance and enforcement. I have a motion to have a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. We have one in opposition. Uh, oh, wait. No, aye. that was a delay. Are you in favor, Mike? Yeah, I'm in favor. Okay. All right. Now any opposed? Now I am uh, exempt, or not exempt. That's unanimous. Yeah, I'll get you unanimous. We just need to. Give me any breaks. Yeah. Uh, break the the farmer's market debrief. I did go uh, my listening tour at the farmer's market this past Thursday. Um, spent some time with the library. Um, and uh, then moved on, because uh, the traffic was not very heavy at the library stand. Uh, but I moved further in towards the uh, concert area and uh, listened with a number of different groups. Um, and uh, I heard a lot of positives. Uh, some people know, noted that Waterbury uh, has already been uh, voted uh, the best beer town in the world. <laughs> Uh, but also the um, Boston Globe uh, nominated it as the best little foodie town in New England mm -hmm. back in May. Um, and uh, that prompted another conversation with a guy saying it should be the best maple town, the best maple syrup town. Those, those are fight words. I would <laughs> say that, you know, I think St. Albans has really got that one sewn up, but he was, he begged to differ and thought that we should go for it. Um, 
So all sorts of, po another positive was somebody complimented the temporary stoplight uh, at uh, bridge number four in Gu on Gupta. They complimented it. They complimented it. They oh. said it was well organized, it was a good safety measure, uh, and it didn't require uh, someone being there, paying a flagger to be there. Mm. Automation. Uh, so they thought that that was very well done by the town. So compliments to our public works department for that. Um, and that they were also happy to see the bridges being repaired. Um, on that same traffic note, uh, someone living on High Street wanted to know if it would be possible in certain circumstances to take a left off of Hill Street, so uh, going on to Railroad Street, because it's, uh, there's more traffic on Stowe Street, particularly when the kids are getting dropped off or whatever. And then the, that sparked more. a discussion about whether that was really very safe and whether you could actually do that. Whether, so that, that was another discussion. Maybe um, in a smart car. Hmm? You can make that turn in a smart car. Right. Okay, so you need a smaller car, <laughs> but it's still illegal, <laughs> according to the sign. So someone else said, you can just go that direction and then find a place to turn around and then go back. So, Are you talking about the, the hairpin turn coming off of Hill Road or Hill Street okay. down onto Railroad Avenue? Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought you I don't, you know. Some of these discussions were, you know, of great magnitude, some were <laughs> larger than others. Um, there was uh, some concern about affordable parking uh, with the loss of the the anticipated loss of 51 South Main. I said that that was going to be brought up and that has been discussed. Um, there was a tent there uh, from a new group called Walk to Shop. It was headed up by Deb Sachs of uh, netzero.org in Burlington. Uh, and uh, they set up a new organization that is selling these little trolley carts. Uh, you can buy a smaller one for $55, a larger one for $65, and it can help you avoid jumping in your car to go less than a mile to go shopping. So you can just like get all the stuff, even like the heavier groceries, and cart it home and to make uh, Waterbury a more walkable, friendly area. Mm. Um, and uh, no people seem to be positive that. I didn't buy mine yet, but uh, it seemed reasonable. Uh, it might be something to look into. Um, and I also suggested that they could go directly to the Village Market, because Village Market, I know, is down on those smaller carts. Mm -hmm. People take them home. And well, I was going to say they're a lot more affordable than buying a shopping cart on Amazon. <laughs> right, the shopping carts. Yeah, I did, I was surprised to learn it cost more than two hundred dollars. Oh, I got one sixty Walmart. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. So, uh, I'll continue on my listening tour. Um, I had two people suggest that uh, we need to become uh, more compliant with the um, age strong. Uh, age-friendly roadmap, which has been put out by the Department of Health and the uh, Vermont uh, Council on Aging, uh, to look at accessibility and um, have you know, design systems that are uh, more designed for seniors in mind. And that uh, a third of our population is already over 65, and that's going to continue to grow. Um, and what else? Um, oh, uh, on that same note, uh, someone asked whether there are defibrillators available uh, in case anyone happens to have a heart attack in the downtown area. 
that you know. Do municipalities typically provide? I guess so. I said, yeah, I imagine there's one at the fire station, but the fire station is not open to the public. Uh, yeah. So that may Are we not help. One here? That's why you call. It's on the list to get okay. one here. Well, I thought Rachel got a grant. She may have already. Yeah, I think, she, I sure. think Rachel told me that she's getting one for here. Okay. At the library or? Mm, Roger, I did not ask her where it would be placed. It would okay. be in the lobby or the uh, library, but. Um, good follow up. Then. And I, I dare say I don't want to be quoted, but I think that's what she told me. Okay. No. Doesn't someone know have to, have to know how to use them, or do you just no? They, 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 they tell you. you. They, they dumb them down. Yeah. 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 They talk to you. And they're apparently they pretty safe. Like you don't have to worry about getting shocked or anything. But you just put them on, hit the go button, and. Uh, I just, I just, I want to correct myself. I don't think it was Rachel that told me that. I think it was Patty, who's one of the friends of the Waterbury Library. Um, okay. Yeah. Still library oriented. Yes, it's still library oriented, but I wanted to. Yeah, be they've, gotten, they've gotten a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. years. I guess for last name. Okay. Haberstick. Patty Haberstick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, that, that's pretty much what I heard uh, on my first venture. Does anyone have any questions? I should say. Roger? Yeah, Mike. Mike. Uh, just a quick question. I know I appreciate your comments about the bridge construction on Guptill Road. I don't know if there's something that we could do. I, I know it's a, a really good thing to have that traffic light versus having flaggers there, but I think it's I think it's a standardized level of timing that the that the the red light goes, and it's some you know, ungodly hours, it it gives you an awful long time where there's either no or there's one car going through. I don't know if that could be set, you know, like you would you would have maybe a longer time during, you know, the morning and evening rush hours and during other times of the day a, a little shorter break. But just a thought. Mm hmm I can look into that. Have you tried meditation? <laughs> Yeah, I don't mind. I I just sit there and I'm fine with it. But I can see where some people would get very irritated with uh, sitting at that traffic light, you know, at at nine o'clock at night, you know, for yeah. Her name is my wife. <laughs> uh, a quick remedy is uh, take Howard. Hmm? If you if you're on Guptil, the quickest remedy <coughs> is to take Howard and get on Route 100. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, you can't avoid it. Yeah, for those of us who have to use Guptill Road, it's kind of a it's a it's a necessary evil. I'm glad to see the bridge being repaired, but you know it is you know you know I have seen some of those different lights. You know that they have different schedules for different right. periods of time that ease traffic flow. The town manager is going to look into this. Uh, just uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like some of the places. Where the where, where the the traffic lights go to blinking lights versus oh, go to um, you know you know regular you know stop lights you know you know at off hours. Yeah, but there's only really room for one vehicle there. Right, that's a different story because it's only a one lane bridge, right. so you have to you you, you couldn't do a, a blinking light. You would create chaos there. But I I could see you know. I don't know things like that. It seems like, you know, in, in in cities, you see they have all kinds of different timings for different kinds of days for different locations to ease traffic flow. And I'm not saying it's cut. It's you know, there's never really a I don't think a backup on Guptill Road. I think it's more just you know, at some times of the day, there's not really a need for the length of you know the red light. I think we got it. Just Alyssa and then Tom. Um, I just wanted to ask what your process was, Roger, in terms of thank you for taking on the first week. And I know I said I might be able to join, it wasn't, but in terms of did you just go introduce yourself to folks and say, hi, I'm chair of the select board, what are your thoughts in terms of how, if we're planning to replicate this moving forward, um, 
and do we want to do i mean you've surfaced many topics for this discussion yeah, yeah, yeah. in terms of how we're just collecting this information um and using it to uh, our yeah i i didn't uh, sort of uh force myself or my title on people directly uh, i just uh, said that i was doing a listening tour uh and then over the course of the conversation i said that i'm on the select board and i wanted to have, know what their thoughts were Cool. Uh, so that's, that's why I approached it. Uh, Tom. Uh, two things. One is um, just for Tom, what's the duration of the bridge project? I mean, I wouldn't want to <coughs> assume this is what? Summer, fall? Um, I, I don't want to give you the wrong numbers. That's okay. I, I, no, it's, it's, it's probably short term and convenient. It's, it's, another, it's another month plus. Okay. And it's, it's the status of the Snow Street Bridge. A couple of years ago, there was a discussion of doing that bridge in the air. Yeah. That's going to be a huge impact back for Perry Hill and that'll be a, shut down. Is that be next a good, year? Is that? That's, um, that's 2026, I believe. Okay. Um, the good news is that bridge was a 5% local share. Yeah, yeah, it is I now it is now only 5% local share. Of, it, it's now it's no longer the the local share is now covered by by the state and the feds uh, up to a point. So um, make yeah. our budget easier in the coming years. Yeah. That is a bridge issue though, right? I mean, that, that's going to be an inconvenience for that side of the area. Yeah. That's, that's going to be rough, especially if you live further down. So I, nothing can be done by but right. education is going to be important, I think, to keep drumming that. I also believe that local matches because it was an expedited 60-day closure to allow them. So I believe the process was instead of doing you know packed closures for a long time, it's a 60-day full closure in hopes of getting it done more quickly, okay. more intense disruption for a shorter period. So I think we did have to approve those um, closures actually several months ago as part of the VTrans package. Um, one town cost may be a pedestrian shuttle because they can't put in a temporary pedestrian bridge. Um, and there's, I think, an MOU with the state to relocate the park and ride okay. down okay. to the That's state office complex. So yeah, the state did come in, I want to say, a year ago um, for that, but it's not, you know, for another yeah. year plus. Okay. But thank you. And Lincoln Street will still be accessible by, uh, to Stowe Street, so you'll be able to use it. You just have to go around by Stowe Street rather than crossing from Route 100. Uh, yeah. Just to um, back on the, the farmer's market bit, I um, wanted to let the select board know that the rec committee is also planning a listening tour cool. at the farmer's market. And they gave us the dates, or they gave them the dates of August 8th and September 12th, um, where they plan to have present at the farmer's market as well. And what are you going to be listening about? Uh, Namely, um, a new uh, rec center and what the community would like to see there, what they envision for that space. Um, uh, but you see, uh, a study's been done already, but um, that's several years old, and we've got some new ideas for the rec center. So, trying to get some public opinion about <coughs> what people might want to see in that facility. I just remember two other things. Uh, people really like the lights that Rotary puts up on the flagpole uh, above uh, Brookside Primary School oh. there, <laughs> and would like them to last longer, like into uh, March. So uh, I can uh, contact Rotary. Uh, we have a Rotarian on the select board. Maybe he can uh, follow up on that. Want to know if they can be extended. Uh, this is just uh, a group of uh, four. I'll, I'll pass that note on in during tomorrow's our rotary meeting. Oh, good. Um, and then also they, uh, that same group wanted to know whether the trash receptacles could be uh, made year-round. Uh, I said that I thought that there was a snow removal problem. Actually, I ran into a public works director, and he confirmed that uh, it's not tremendously feasible, but he might be able to leave one or two uh, in the uh, downtown area to uh, collect uh, the uh, dog uh, remnants. Um, so uh, anything else on uh, listening to us?
Should we, anyone want to uh, volunteer to uh, take up the next listening tour uh, at the farmer's market or elsewhere? I'm going from four to six this week. I have housing task force at six, but I'm happy to look prior to them. Four to six on Thursday? I'd be, I'd be glad to do a lot of them because for Rotary, I'll probably be there at from 5.30 to 8.30, you know, and, and it's just a matter of, you know, I know the farmer's market's kind of ending a little bit early because it's still early in the season for them. There's not as much, you know, produce and stuff for them to sell, but I'd be glad to help out in any way because I'll be there for most of the uh, concerts in the park. All right. Well, listen, are we, we going to have, like, an official table or... Because I know after I spoke to you, Roger, I looked for, you said you were, you were being with the, the library, and I guess they had already left. Yeah, they, well, and they were way down uh, the, uh, towards the main street side of uh, the farmer's market, and the traffic was, uh, I was talking to the librarian, the library people and friends of the library, but we weren't getting a lot of uh, outside uh, input, so I just mingled with the rest of the crowd. Uh, and I think that's a good way to do is kind of work the crowd. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I'll meet up with you on Thursday, Mike. We'll make a plan. Okay. Good. All right. Well, then with that, uh, let's move on to uh, agenda for the next meeting, which will be July 1st. Good job keeping the agenda. Yeah, of course. Oh, you can just no. line up if you need it. Probably on no. the back or something. Yeah. Just like this front to back. I have about nine additional You can use mine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so what we have so far uh, are the usual um, things. And then uh, consider board appointments for two vacancies on the Conservation Commission. It's two vacancies on natural disaster, not one. Oh, OK. Who, who are those two then? Well, we lost one right off the bat, and then another one. Um, and are the highlights? We lost uh, Ryan Van Tynan after our first meeting, and then Joe Wurzbacher bowed out a few weeks. Okay, I think I still ago. have Ryan on the website, so I'll wait him. Yeah, that's too big. Okay. But I know we have some interested parties. Well, I'm not hearing from them. Um, yeah, I do still have Ryan Van Tynan on there, so I can do that. Um, um, yeah, the only, the yellow is because I haven't heard from anybody. Okay. So it might come off if there's nothing right. to consider. Um, and and the I'm, library commission has uh, The library two, has two already. Two, uh, for one vacancy, so yes. we have to That's great. dial that out again. All right, good. Um, Maybe one will consider another commission. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one on the tree board. Okay. I just good? advertised these again today on Front Porch Forum. I had put them on Front Porch Forum last week on the 11th. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, you got a couple of responses? Uh, yeah, but not from natural disaster. There were two people came that um, I think you and um, John Malter specifically asked me to reach out to. Mm -hmm. And I did that. And I heard from neither of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, and uh, we received a petition today uh, to add uh, a, a resolution uh, to support an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, uh, signed by 70 uh, constituents. Yeah, so I have a little list up mm -hmm. here of the things that okay. need to be added. So we'll add that, and we're okay with that. Um, and then uh, sign the, uh, the bylaw from the... Sign uh, from the roundabout. Sign from the roundabout. And then uh, the ethics code. Yeah. And the open meeting law mm -hmm. issues. Um, Open meeting law, we're just going to follow, mm -hmm. but yeah. ethics code will need to be a little bit of, little bit of action. Okay. So we don't have to talk about the open meeting law again, do we? 
I don't think so. We just have to follow it. Yeah. I'll make everyone aware of what needs to be done for different boards, but we're just going to get it implemented. Yeah. Uh, on the surface, it seems quite easy to tell, for example, the Cemetery Commission, oh, you have to tape your meetings. It's not that easy. <laughs> it's not, you know, there's many members of these boards that don't have a vested interest in Zoom. We don't have a training um, for how to use Zoom. And they don't have a staff member. So um, while, I, while I will help all of them as best I can, I'm not volunteering to attend five other meetings. Um, but we will make sure that one way or another it happens. But it may, it may mean, it, I don't know what it may mean. I don't know if it's going to mean staffing them or or like another Zoom when the Planning Commission had someone who was still logged in from another meeting log in that showed up as town of Waterbury again, which is like, do we need another account to manage yeah, this? Yeah, those or? things, that may come up. In theory, we shouldn't have two town meetings happening simultaneously. Right, it was a holdover from um, the But um, anyway, so we'll, we'll just see how things go. Could, they, uh, could the uh, Cemetery Commission agree to uh, have their hearing on the spending uh, of the, their uh, fund at a select board meeting? <laughs> if, um, they'll, if they only tap it once a year. Uh, Good question. I better get answers to those. Okay. That way all their other meetings would have to be recorded. Um, for Planning Commission, we have the bylaw update public hearing, and then I'm wondering about the separate agenda item for your upcoming Planning Commission work timeline. Yeah, like the, I wrote one in. The, the separate, okay. Yeah. 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 So my, my copy over here says phase two timeline. Um, Could you say phase two in town plan, if that's what we think we're going to talk about? Right. Mm. We also oh. moved the uh, signs and right of way to July 1st, and what it says in my notes. Yeah. 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 Um, we did get a petition from uh, Scott Culver to address the uh, entertainment permit, but as he noted, uh, that that will be over uh, by the by our next meeting, uh, which uh, leads us to question whether we want the special meeting. I haven't, I haven't received that from him. I don't know if it went to anyone, any staff, or just the select board. Um, I received yeah, an email he sent me from a, a nice big old packet with a lot of photos of computer screens. Um, mm -hmm. I, I only read the first. Uh, the first yeah, computer screen? The select board. Yeah. Uh, and Gary Dillon. CC Gary Dillon. Um, um, I'll forward it to you. Um, but... Uh, I guess uh, it seemed to me like we uh, had three uh, meetings with uh, those petitioners uh, for the entertainment permit, and, and my reading was that they addressed uh, our concerns, and that's why we passed it. He approached me, if I, if I may comment on it for a moment, he mm -hmm. approached me a few days ago, Scott did, um, claiming that the folks who are running the event, who chat and these three meetings, are charging vendors to use their space, which is technically public space, which was the biggest thing he had a problem with at that moment when we spoke. Isn't that uh, common practice? <coughs> uh, if you're going to organize a sure. event, you charge people for uh, the service? Not our, not our business, mm -hmm. I don't think. Yeah, it it's isn't. the same thing that they did last year. They charged their vendors, mm -hmm. we charged them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing at the staff level I've really been made aware of is that, um, you know, as vendors go to the craft fair, they better give us their insurance requirements. And we don't have a comprehensive list yet. We're still a few weeks out, and I can understand these are small vendors, so sometimes getting that is a little bit last minute. Yeah. Um, so that's a bit of a concern, but I think parking issues have been addressed, I think safety issues have been addressed. I think there's a lot of ways for Gary Dillon to get a fire truck into that field, gates or not. Um, I think this select board did a lot to do to inside. Okay. So no, no special meeting. Can we, just throw, can we put um, parade and event 
permitting process in the parking lot. I guess for me, like I think the piece it brings up or that my concern would be like disparate treatments of different events, just acknowledging like we have Arts Fest with many vendors, and I know that's on private property, not town property, but we gave that a big old check mark, have a nice day. And so I do think there's something to be said or each event having the same thing. I'll dig into Montpelier, I know it's a mess. I saw a parade came up in all the parking we had tonight, but I would say my proposal would be just put it in the park in the parking lot. Um, to try and not have this in the future. I would also say that our our my rec system, when you when you reserve a field, you can do it 364 days in advance. So the Monday after NQID, both this vendor and the other vendor who tried to reserve the field are going to try to do it. Mm -hmm. I've already said to Katarina, nope, no one reserves it for NQID until 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 we can sort some of these issues out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, maybe that's something. That yeah, event do. reservation policy and yeah. parade policy, whatever. I think that's really maybe underlying the issue here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can I speak to it real Please. quick? Please. I did Please participate in a meeting with Maggie, Woody, Gary, Katarina, Mike Bishop, and myself. If mm -hmm. I, and I am amiss to think of any others. but. Um, the software that Mike has been authorized to purchase is going to have an online platform mm -hmm. where, for events such as this. So we are working to streamline it. And the software appears to be really fantastic in that it will ask the applicant certain questions and then the responses go directly to the, the proper people. So if they want to close the street, Bill Woodruff would be made aware if they have um, X number of participants, Maggie Burke will be made aware of her emergency response. So it's it's not up it's yet, but it's we did have our first meeting and we all have a little bit of homework, including trying to get all the different permits together and see where they overlap and how they how they can best be implemented. Mm -hmm. So we are working on that. Yeah. That's so exciting. Just to say, like, to me, that answers the question of, like, as how do I, as an applicant, know who needs to get contacted and if the software will do it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Mike well, has his hand up. Uh, Mike. Yeah. Scott also approached me about that whole thing, and we had a discussion about the whole craft show thing, and I know he's very disappointed in the select board. And I told him that the group that was putting on this craft show, you know, they came to us multiple times. We gave them different marching orders. They provided things, and his response was they weren't being truthful in what their answers were. And that's something we just can't, you know, you know, anticipate. And I said, if they don't do what they said they were going to do in their application, yes, if they are looking at getting a permit in the future, that's probably going to affect you know, future permits. And that's all I could say to him is say, you know, we asked multiple questions. They ad address multiple things. And, you know, I guess I'm one, if they're saying, you know, it's basically in testimony that they're making, you know, certain assertions, how, how are we going to doubt that unless we have, you know, information to the contrary? So... It's just, a, it's a difficult issue. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and I'll also note that we did actually require uh, ArtsFest to have uh, compliant cross, uh, crossing guards or traffic. Uh, M-U-T-C-D. M -U -T -C -D. <laughs> so that was a point that was addressed. Um, okay. Uh, housing Trust update. Oh, the, um, the special event for the car show. And um, Angie Harpin, who's the head of Down Street, is prepared to attend the July 1st meeting to talk about how their programs might overlap or how they might administer programs on behalf of the town. Great. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Schedule her late after okay. the bylaw hearing or early? <laughs> um, police stats and evaluation. I think 
making her suffer through the bylaw hearing would just be cruel and unusual. <laughs> I'm, I'm agreeing to that less explicitly, so yes, I think we should be Move strategic. Yeah. Okay. Um, Can I just draw an arrow for me? So we're moving housing update to 8 o'clock, which bumps everything down, including the CBRPC bike share, so you have, there's people attending that as well. Yeah, I think once you get through the bylaws and the housing trust, you're going to be pretty late in the evening already. Is the bike share time sensitive? So and we should move bike we'll share up to? the deadline for the bike share, but they felt like they had some leniency. Because they got a hold of me on... Uh, How much time did they ask for? Friday, Thursday or Friday. It was, yeah. Yeah. Most of them right after I left. Was it um, Doug or someone else? Christian Meyer. Oh, Christian. oh, thank you. I would have never been able to pull that name out. <laughs> Who's the EA? Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we can sort out who has priority in terms of the okay. ranking here. Okay. Um, state police, uh, police stats and uh, evaluation of statistics. What's that? I'm going to guess I made a motion to put at this meeting to buy us time, but I think we had the context with the conversation in the context of renew, renewing the contract, that there was discussion that there is um, monthly or quarterly data reports we get, and are mm -hmm. we getting them, and how are we looking at the data? Roger's getting um, a new month for us today, so. No, are posting one today. Perfect. Um, I would say I'm fine with a substantive discussion about that being moved um, in in agenda planning purposes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to the uh, move towards the end of the <coughs> evening or uh, move to a different day? Personally, I would go for a different day just in light of bylaw and everything else, but that's me. Do you like uh, the uh, 15th of July? Yes, we do. The 15th of July looks too crowded. We can bump it again. Uh, the bump out for uh, Stone's Throw. And Casey's Bagels. <laughs> and Casey's Bagels. Well, we don't know if Casey's Bagels is totally buying on this yet. But, uh, I'm hoping to have a full packet of information ready for July 1 for that. Okay. Not, let's keep it on there as a, as a target. Yeah, I mean, uh, my concern is if we keep on bumping it, then uh, the season for it will be done. And uh, then we'll get any benefit. I think it's important to keep it there, but I don't think it needs to be first. Um, mm -hmm. Leave people traffic. I will put this on my to do list right now. Call them. That could be moved, right? And we have a while to get to Yeah, that one could be moved, <laughs> but it's, all, it's also been one of those that's been sitting around in a parking lot for a long time. And I don't, I, I'm going to hope and guess that it's going to be something we can address fairly quickly. So let's leave it there until further notice. Uh, and then uh, next agenda item. And uh, that's it. Anyone else have anything else uh, pressing that should be on the July 1st agenda? Yes, Alyssa. Do we want to do text, my gov? I'll say I sat in on the demo today <coughs> about the text that it came, texting thing. It could be the 15th, I don't, but. Um, Word. Uh, which what are we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, Tom had, I think, sent everyone that there was a. Not uh, everyone. Oh, okay. Sorry, my bad. Um, texting. It was for flood response around communication oh. menus, and so we had a demo from a vendor around one that would let Text people like enroll. Up. Yes. Yeah. Text like that. Okay. That one. Um, and we had a demo today, so I didn't. Um, it could be the 15th in my mind. It doesn't have to be, but in terms of if we want to think about sharing that and or next steps for implementing. Yeah. I don't feel like um, I why don't we see how the, the timing works out again. and then we can decide yeah, whether true. we got time on the Natural first or not for the 15th. Um, I'll have to talk to John Walter. Liz had sent me a text during the meeting that she, she seemed to like. Hmm. All right. Anything else for uh, July 1st?
do we need an executive session to discuss anything? Um, I think I'm real estate conversation. Okay. Yes, um, uh, I will entertain a motion. I move to find that premature knowledge of pending real estate matters would clearly place the town of Waterbury at a substantial disadvantage. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Now I will entertain the second motion. Um, I move to enter executive session for the purpose of real estate transaction discussions and to invite the municipal manager to join us live. Do I have a second? Second. Move and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we are moving to executive session. Just Mike, are you on a phone? Can we